<laughs> How you doing? Fade to black. All fired up here. Fade to black. Bespoke radio for the masses. Today's Wednesday, October 15th. How you doing? 285 days into the new year. Welcome to everybody listening all around the world. Across the United States, hither and thither, to and fro, back and forth, far and near, north and south, east and west. Did I leave one out? No, I didn't. We are live from the JP Motorsports Studios right here in downtown Burbank, California. And if you know Burbank, it's about the size of the dime in your pocket. If you're in Burbank, come by the studio. For KJCR and the Dark Matter Radio Network, I am your oh-so-humble host, Jimmy Church. Big salute to the proud men and women in uniform all around the world, fighting the good fight for us, protecting that right of free speech, the Constitution. Keith, you got to get us on AFN, Armed Forces Network. You got to. They would love Dark Matter. They would love it. Think about it. Well, this show. I don't know. You know, you can't speak for everybody else. All right. Podcast semi updated. It's all done. I can take a breather. Go check it out. If you haven't subscribed, just go to the website. It's right there. All right. Let's get this one cracking. Is everybody ready? It's so funny. I, 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 I'm I sitting here doing the show. And when I speak, I just glance over to Twitter to, to watch the ebb and flow. The reaction stuff. I love it. True interaction. Follow us on Twitter at J Church Radio. What you want to do. What you want to do is hashtag DM Radio Net. Hashtag DM Radio Net. Jump into the sandbox. Come hang out with us at J Church Radio. Jack Thompson, look at you. That's what I'm talking about. That, that'll that get a retweet. Watch this. Bang. Done. That's what I'm talking about. Need to hang one of those right behind me in the studio. <laughs> I've thought about it, too. I have thought about it. Reminds me of, uh, what was that guy's name? Uh, Something George. Oh, that had the talk show here on uh, UHF in Los Angeles. Oh, oh, something George with the uh, bad toupee and the gray hair. What was his name? And he had the American flag behind him. Uh, Wally George. Wally George. You know, the rest of the country, uh, not to go off on a tangent, but the rest of the country just never uh, got to enjoy Wally George. Wally George, Wally George was like, uh, like, you know, like Howard Stern, an old version, kind of like that, kind of like combination of uh, Jerry Springer and. Uh, he was a sign of things to come, and he was on UHF on one of the you know, channel whatever um, here in Los Angeles. And I don't think he he got across the country. I think he was just here. I wonder if there's Wally George on YouTube. I'm, need to. Uh, that's it. Walanda tonight. Tonight after the show, Wally George, not Ugly George. Wally George. Wally George, W-A-L-L-Y George, Wally George. He used to live in Sherman Oaks. I used to see him run, running around. Okay. Anyway, how did I? Oh, yeah, the American flag, Wally George. Today, let's get this one cracking. Let's go. Today, actor Larry Miller, 61 years old. And let me tell you something. That's one of the funniest guys in the business right there, Larry Miller. Larry I was uh, walking through the mall, Rita and I, uh, a few years back. Sherman Oaks were, were literally, wa- and he walks by us. I'm like, dude, there's Larry Miller. He's right there. He's in all the Christopher Guest movies. Just a funny, funny, funny guy. 
Also today, skateboarding icon, Stacy Peralta, 57 years old. There's a guy right there that changed the world. Changed the world. Also today, Richard Carpenter, that's right, of the Carpenters. Where, where is he? He was from uh, Downey, Downey, California. I'm sure when you cross the city line there in Downey, it's got to say home of the Carpenters uh, somewhere. Uh, yes, I'm a Carpenters fan. I'll admit it. I'll go there right now. There's not a Carpenter song that I don't know. Word for word. Love the Carpenters. Absolutely love it. How do you say the Carpenters and Metallica in the same sentence on a radio show? I just did. Carpenters rocked. He's 68 years old. Actor Dominic West, 45 years old today. How do you make the cut? How do you make the cut on this birthday list? How do you make the cut? You know what? You change lives. Larry Miller, icon. Stacy Peralta, icon. Richard Carpenter, icon. Dominic West, you dang skippy. 45 years old. He was in 300. He was in that tremendous series on Showtime, The Wire. He's in John Carter. He's currently stars in a, a new series called The Affair, but that's not his best stuff. Oh, no. Oh, no. Dominic West played Kurt Cuddy, guitarist for Steel Dragon in the movie Rockstar. When you see, when I see Dominic West all the time on TV, see him, and he's cool. He's great. He's a great actor. He really is. But he nailed it in Rockstar. Absolutely nailed it. And you just don't go play a heavy metal guitar player. You know, obviously it was supposed to be Judas Priest. Uh, you don't, you, you come from somewhere. And I'm telling you, Dominic has got it in his DNA. He slayed in Steel Dragon. All right. Our dead guy birthday today is Frederick. Nietzsche, born in 1844, died in 1900 at the age of 55. Dude challenged Christianity, challenged traditional morality with books like Beyond Good and Evil. I know you read that. Twilight of the Idols, you better have that. And Thus Spake, Zarathustra. Not also spoke. But thus spake Zarathustra. Nietzsche. (laughs) How do you make the cut? Well, he did. Deservedly so. Okay. All right. Let's stir up Twitter. Let's do it. I have to. This is what's on everybody's mind. So I'm going to do it right now. What are you more worried about, fate or nots? Ebola or ISIS? What 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 are you worried about? Because the media definitely wants you, wants you to be scared of both. The onslaught of the last month has been insane. <laughs> Liam just said <laughs> stupidity. Sandy Hook. Back stupidity, wise frog humans. What 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 bothers you more right now? What are you worried about? I'll be talking about Ebola uh, more in just a minute. Follow us on Twitter at JChurch Radio hashtag DM Radio Net. And uh, Jack Thompson says he's hanging out. He's got a fire pit going on, and he's watching. He's UFO watching tonight. Jack, anything happens, man? You going to send me a pic? You're going to send me a pic real time? MG says Ebola. Ebola, Ebola. Yeah, Ebola. If you had to pick one, Liam says Ebola. Space Boy, Ebola. MC Ryder says, I fear nothing. Method says nothing, neither. Wow. Mr. Anthony, Ebola. Mark Davich, Ebola. 
Cozy Hound says, more afraid of those little bugs than those ones that I can aim and shoot at. <laughs> yeah. That's a good answer. That's a good answer. All right. Tonight, Josh Reeves. Oh, yeah. Josh Reeves in the house tonight. So fired up about that. And uh, all the guests this week, I, I think last week too as well, all requests from you. Never forget that. All right? This is Bespoke Radio. It's for you. I'm just the guy sitting at the mic. That's what's going on. I'm sitting at the mic, enjoying myself, having a good time with you. These guests are your request. And Josh uh, is somebody that I've, I've listened to for, for a long, long time. Really appreciate his point of view, his points of view. But relentless email. And finally, I caved. And I only caved because um, Josh is somebody that could come onto this show every single night. We could talk for three hours, and I could never have another guest, and it's all good. You know, it's just one of those things. I just I wanted to hold Josh back. I just wanted to hold him off, hold him off. Well, I, I, I couldn't hold it off anymore, the urge. And I will do my best tonight to not sound like a fanboy. Okay? Josh is the man. I'm really looking forward to, uh, to our conversation tonight. And I have no idea what we're going to talk about. I have no clue where we're going to go. There's enough current events today to, to we can just pick one subject and go. There's all of his, well, anyway, anyway, there's, I have no idea. And I'm, I'm just fired up. But once in a while, uh, we can bring on a guest, you know, whether it's somebody like, you know, Jay Widener or uh, Jim Mars, you know, guests like that where, you know, they come on the show and it's just a natural conversation and it's great. It's great. Well, uh, well like both nights this week, too, we're, we're that way. Josh is another one of those. And so hopefully <laughs> watch. <We're> just <laughs> There you go. I just jinxed it. Oh, and I will uh, ask Josh about open lines. I think, uh, think enough of you would like to, uh, to chime in. Okay. Email throughout the show, Jimmy at Jimmy church radio.com. You can also go over to the website last night with, uh, uh, butch. That was a stunning show to me. Stunning show. It was one of those shows where uh, um, you're like shocked into uh, being aware. You know how you have that adrenaline rush, you know, just you have to pump the brakes in your car. You know, somebody pulls out in front of you. <gasps> you have that little thing that happens and your adrenaline just boom all the way to your toes. And then suddenly you are alert and aware and you can see the world in 3D, 4D, 5D. That's what happened last night with Butch. And I spoke to him today. I did get some email yesterday about uh, Todd C's, and I forwarded it to uh, Butch today and we talked again. And I got to tell you, that was, uh, that was one of those shows last night. And uh, I know that Eugene was on Sky Watchers last night after the show. And uh, I wanted to call in, but I was so amped, so we didn't leave the studio. We stayed here, and we listened uh, to Eugene and just kind of wound down and came down off of uh, Butch Witkowski. And that's what I did last night. So uh, did anybody listen, uh, to, uh, anybody listen to Eugene last night? I don't know if anybody did. Uh, I I kind of checked out of uh, Twitter and relaxed and ate some snacks here and listened to Eugene. So, um, but anyway, Eugene uh, did his debut last night. How did Eugene do? Okay, with that, let's get to this first break. I see everybody is here. Everybody is accounted for. Everybody is present. George says Eugene rocked it last night. Cool. Right on. Top five show? What does that mean? What does that mean? <laughs> this is Fade to Black. Bespoke radio for the masses. Tonight, Josh Reeves. Tomorrow night is Fader Night. Favorite night of the week. Second favorite night after Josh. Or third favorite after Butch. 
Oh, wait, we can't forget about Bruce McAbee. That's what kind of week it has been here at Fade to Black. I'm your humble host, Jimmy Church. Shoot me an email to jimmy at jimmychurchradio.com. Follow us on Twitter at jchurchradio. I'll be back right after this. Stay with us. You're listening to Jimmy Church Fade to Black on the Dark Matter Radio Network. Ladies and gentlemen, girls and boys, you have tuned into the latest phenomenon in late night talk radio, Fade to Black, starring the inimitable Jimmy Church, showcasing his continuing quest in pursuit of knowledge of the strange and paranormal. Sit back, open your mind, and let's get cracking. What's up, revolutionaries? It's me, Jimmy Church. Do you have an IRS or state tax issue? Well, I did, and I called national tax experts. My problems were fixed, done, fini, and man, I gotta tell you, it was a relief. National tax experts are a recognized tax office that services clients in all 50 states. Doesn't matter where you live. Give them a call. I'm telling you, they take the time to understand each and every client's individual financial status as well as their financial goals. And that's exactly what you need, my brother, when you're taking on the evil three letter. So, seriously, give them a call today at 1-877-909-5444. Again, 1-877-909-5444. Or go check out their website, www.nattaxexperts.com. That's N-A-T-T-A-X-E-X-P-E-R-T-S.com. Tell them Jimmy sent you. This is KJCR at JimmyChurchRadio.com. On the Dark Matter Radio Network. All right. Welcome back. Fade to Black, the spoke radio for the masses. I'm your humble host, Jimmy Church. Oh, so humble. All right. Let's get to some email. This one from Ben Miller. I believe most of us can avoid Ebola with a little common sense behavior in public, but Look at this headline from a section of the L.A. Times. Virus transmitting yellow fever mosquitoes discovered in L.A. County. Now, I, I, I got the email, Ben. But there's one thing that the rest of the country needs to know. We don't have mosquitoes here. I don't know what part of L.A. County they're talking about. <laughs> mosquitoes don't exist. We don't have a, a lot of the flying insects that, you know, you go, you go, once you leave LA and you head to the humidity and you go to the Midwest and the East coast and stuff, you have all crazy gunships flying around called insects in, insanity. We don't have that here. Um, I haven't been bitten by a mosquito in oh, in the Midwest, but, but as long as you're here in LA County, no mosquitoes. I don't know where they're talking about <clears throat> but that is some isolated swamp somewhere i have no idea i i first i heard about it so there you go there are uh, the, again it's the media just trying to freak you out there's no mosquitoes here in southern california okay email from alejo corona he says i just listened to your radio show about the underwater base in malibu I live in Los Angeles, and my wife and I like to drive to Santa Monica at night going towards Malibu. We have a spot out there where we like to park our car on the side of the road, walk down to the sand. Now, we do this at night sometimes twice a week. Well, one night we were sitting in the sand having our coffee when all of a sudden we see lights underwater in the distance. These look like giant spotlights moving underwater. 
We sat there watching these lights for about an hour when all of a sudden a U.S. Coast Guard helicopter appeared out of nowhere and hovered around these lights for about 20, mi- 20 minutes. I couldn't believe what, I, what was happening. We freaked out a little bit and decided to leave right after the helicopter flashed the lights at us. Another night, we came back to the same spot, and there it was again. But this time, you could feel the sand vibrating under our feet. It was weird. Well, that night, this thing decided to fly out of the water. It was a very dark night. But out in the distance, you could see this ball of light coming out of the water and flying out towards the Malibu coast. There you go. Thank you, Alejo. And uh, next time, take a picture, will you? Uh, this is from Renee. I'm telling you, something's going on out there in Malibu. For anybody that wants to write, man, man I've lived out here for years. I don't get it. I, we don't see anything. What are you talking about, people sitting out there in chairs and watching the light show every night? There you go. There's another report for you. This is from Renee. She says, I believe I'm being perfectly reasonable in expecting prosecution for a felony crime for the Ebola-infected nurse who traveled by air with, uh, with a fever after caring for the Ebola uh, patient, Duncan. Am I out of line for thinking this was a criminal endangerment? It certainly meets the legal definition and is punishable in some states by a fine of $50,000 and up to 10 years in jail. Maybe that would make her think twice before, again, risking the lives of others. Could not agree with you more. Could not agree with you more. Uh, you know, the, the headline on CNN right now is she should not have been on the plane. How did the nurse get on that flight? How did she end up on the plane? Dallas Mayor Mike Rollins said, I don't know. I'm asking a lot of questions today. There's no way she should have been on that flight. She was being monitored here in Dallas. What does that even mean? And if she was being monitored correctly, I think she should have never gotten on that flight. I don't get what's monitored. Uh, Who was doing the monitoring? How do you get on a flight? Book the ticket. Don't don't you ask permission? I had heard some stuff today that she checked with the CDC. The CDC said go. She had a temperature of 99.5. 99.5. And I guess it's it's got to be 100 degrees or 100.5. She's a nurse. She should have known better. I don't get it. I really don't. The day before uh, she went to the hospital with Ebola systems, Amber Benson, that's her name, was flying across the country on a commercial jet with 132 passengers. How is that possible? I don't get it. She flew from Dallas-Fort Worth to Cleveland on October 10th, my birthday. And this is what's crazy. October 13th, she's on Frontier Airlines. On October 13th, she headed home. Now, I, it's not about me, but I just want to paint this picture. I flew to Ohio. I flew through, we, not I, we, we flew through Houston. They're in Dallas. Fly through Houston and to Ohio, to Columbus. And then back on the same days that she's cruising through Ohio. Now, I'm all I'm saying is what were the odds of me flying on that same weekend or anybody else? And her flying through the same state, states, Texas and Ohio. Now, it's not about me. I'm just saying it spreads. And she's in Cleveland. And then next thing you know, you know, those people are getting on other flights. Could have flown through 
you know, Columbus, I don't know. What about Houston, Dallas, Fort Worth, where she left from? Think about this for a second. I was right there. I am just one of, you know, what, millions of people that are on planes that day? But that's how it that's how it gets out. What what is she thinking about? It it blows my mind. I was uh I was talking to uh John Elias, Dr. J earlier today about this subject. And just like anything else, any other crazy thing like this that happens, pick some virus, pick some disease, look at you know, leper colonies or whatever. You need to isolate it. Isolate it. As as bad as it sounds, the flights that need to go in and out of Liberia right now are food and medical supplies, but no people. That's it. Isolate this thing. We knew. We knew the second that those two patients came over, those two doctors came over here to the United States, and this guy Duncan, and the next thing you know, I mean, what what are what is Washington, D.C. thinking about with a situation like this? You you it, if you don't want it, want it out of control, then you just don't bring it here. Well, it doesn't. It, it's okay. Well, now look what we've got and what we're dealing with. That's it. <laughs> That's it. Shut Liberia down. As soon as it's done and it's all cleared up and we've got it under control, then, then it's okay. But until then... Fly in food, fly in humanitarian aid, and do all of that. Drop it off at the airport and get the planes out of there. But no people. That's it. <laughs> Kick the baggage out of the door, let it hit the tarmac, and then fly out of there. I know it's nuts. But that's what, you know, and the, the, the issues that we have today with 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 the media and the fear and the 24-hour news cycle now that it is Ebola on CNN is being caused right now because we allowed it into the country or any other country. That's it. It's not it's not out of control yet. Stop it now. Man, if I was president, I need to run for office. That's it. I need to run for office. <laughs> I'll, uh, I would have no problems. And bringing down the gavel and saying that, no, 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 America first. The, the world comes first. It needs to be stopped. And that's my, that's, ugh, that's my soapbox. I had so many other things I want to talk. I knew I was going to do that. Ugh. I mean, what can we do? But the good news is. Kansas City is heading to the World Series. <laughs> Let's hear it for the Kansas City Royals. First time since 1985. They'll be facing either the Giants or the Cardinals. St. Louis Cardinals. George Norris team, by the way, I'm sure. And uh, the Giants right now have a 2-1 to one lead in their best of seven series. The Royals went a combined 6-1 and one against St. Louis and San Francisco during the regular season. And I got to say, it's a good time <laughs> to be a citizen of Kansas City. Good for them. With that, let's head to Josh Reeves. You guys ready? Fader Lucian? <laughs> Fader Lucian? Is that what I just saw? Oh, man, that's a retweet. Let's do it. Hold on, am I got a fedora on? Oh, good Lord. This is Fade to Black, only on the Dark Matter Radio Network. When I come back, Josh Reeves in the house. Stay with us, everybody. Are you afraid of the dark? Don't move. Don't touch that mouse. You are listening to Fade to Black, bespoke radio for the masses on jimmychurchradio.com. Way out here, we listen to Jimmy Church on the Dark Matter Radio Network. 
Dark Matter. Dark Matter. Dark Matter. Dark Matter. Dark Matter. Dark matter. You're listening to Fade to Black on the Dark Matter Radio Network. ¿Qué tal, mis amigos? Yo soy Mario Carzanel, tiburón, y los invito para que escuchen a mi buen amigo Jimmy Church Radio. ¡Claro que sí! Hoy, hoy, I'm Reese Evans, you're listening to Jimmy Church. This is a revolution. The revolution will not be televised. The revolution is on radio. Ciao. For the masses, I am your humble host, Jimmy Church. Let's get this one cracking. Man, you know, it, it's so cool. You're, that will get your adrenaline flowing. You know, somebody dynamic like Josh Reeves is about to come up when you hear those tunes. Let's get this one cracking. Josh Reeves has spent years of researching government conspiracies and secret societies. He is a talk show host, filmmaker, and explorer. Reeves has dived in headfirst into the world of hidden ancient mysteries. Stemming from his 10 years of research on the ancient rock wall in the suburbs of his hometown of Dallas, Texas, Josh has released almost six hours worth of film in 2013 and 2014 with his Lost Secrets of the Ancient America series. Volume 3 of the series is currently in production. If you want to support his efforts uh, to complete his film, just go to his website. Josh is an independent researcher who brings over 25 years of research in his quest to expose the hidden truths. His uncensored radio show, and it is uncensored, The Global Reality is now in its seventh year of broadcasting. Congratulations to that, Josh, and welcome to the program. How are you? Hey, I'm doing great, Jimmy. Thanks you. Thank you so much for having me on tonight, and I'm really excited to get into everything with you here tonight on the show. Uh, I don't even know where we're going to start, Josh, but you know, this, uh, this is a funny thing with you. Um, uh, and take this the wrong way. Okay. <laughs> take this the wrong way. Uh, I get, I get the attitude of, of Alex Jones and the, and the tone of Alex Jones, but I get the knowledge of like Jim Mars and they're all from, you're all from Texas. So, you know, it's like, uh, and that's what I get uh, from you. And you know what? I, you know, I don't know if you've ever heard this. Uh, I've certainly never said this to you, but I'm going to say it now. Has anybody ever told you you sound like Sam Kennison? Yes, many times. Oh, you have. Okay, yeah, so it's not, it's not just me. Nope, not you at all. And, and actually, it's a, it's a total compliment. Someone said that to me one time, and I, I went, the first time someone said it, I was kind of like, nah, I don't see it. And then I went and listened to a Sam Kennison thing, and I went, oh, no, never mind. It's, it's a compliment. I'll take it. <laughs> I worked for uh, Kennison for for quite a while in did you? Uh, in the oh I sure did in the eighties another Texas boy too yeah 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 and he uh, he influenced me quite a bit um, in 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 good ways and bad ways really cool guy really 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 cool guy but his his voice is something that um, when you become close to somebody it's you know you're attuned to it right. and there are times when I listen to you. Where you, you for for a few minutes, and I know you you don't realize because it's just you, but right. you suck me in, and I feel like Sam is in the room, and that is just brilliant. It is well, that's so a cool. huge compliment. I mean, Sam Kennison is was one of the greats. I mean, absolutely, it's amazing that you got a chance to work with him. But I really think it's just a Texas vibe more than anything else. I mean, Alex Jones actually grew up in the same general area where I grew up, and you know, Jim Morris was from Dallas his whole life and stuff too. Went to school. Uh, in North Texas here in Dallas. So, I mean, it, I think it's just a Texas thing and a Texas vibe. And I think because we've had so much craziness go on in this state through the decades, and actually when you look into my work through the centuries, 
that it, uh, you know, we all sort of have that Texas vibe and that thing that we bring to the table in this research. I'm just glad that there's um, so many of us out here doing it. I just wish there were more. Tell uh, for, uh, for our audience, most uh, have heard, you know, uh, your program and you over right. the years, but but, you know, where where did you get your start? Tell us about that really quick. That's the only softball, by the way, for the night. After that, no, we're no going to go deep. No problem. I mean, I actually just started out, you know, for years just as a researcher. I mean, before I was doing radio or making films or anything, I was just wanting to learn and, and wanting to have knowledge on my own. So it started as that, and then it kind of morphed into, you know, doing local activism stuff. And then once I did local activism stuff and I wanted to get the message out, to more people and reach more people. I was one of the original people that started the 9-11 Truth Movement back in the day here in Dallas, and I just wasn't satisfied with how many people we were reaching. So in uh, 2007, right after I came out with my first film, uh, a friend of mine that had a little radio network asked me to come on, and I've just been going ever since. With um, And that's a, that's a actually, this is a natural segue. Over the last uh, couple of months, we have uh, certainly, you know, we had the anniversary of 9-11 and, 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 and that helps. But over the last couple of months, uh, a lot of conversation uh, with different guests on the show and, and fader knots and phone calls and, and so forth, open lines, about 9-11. And I was just on Carrie Cassidy's show uh, last week or the week before, and she asked me very directly what my views were with 9-11 and Sandy Hook. And my my take is because you you've uh, you've been on that side of the fence since the the very beginning of the movement, and and my view today, which I find totally fascinating, is the if you took a poll on the streets now today, I I I would venture to guess that most most people in this country think. The government was involved with 9-11. And that's as crazy as that sounds, and it is crazy, um, uh, the day after 9-11, that would have been crazy talk. You know, now it seems like the status quo, the norm, is that the government was involved. And that is scary if Washington, D.C. even knew about 9-11 before it happened. That, that, if, and if you know what I mean, that's bad enough right there. Um, and how do you feel about that? The, the tide has turned. Well, I, I kind of feel mixed sentiments about it, actually, Jimmy. I mean, I think in some ways it's a good thing, but I think in other ways it's a bad thing. Because the fact of the matter is, um, if you look at the evidence, you can see and tell for yourself without anybody having to tell you or really give you the facts that, we did not get told the whole story about 9-11. We haven't got told the whole story about a lot of these things, like Sandy Hook, as you mentioned, or any of the rest. But the fact of the matter is, is that any person, any rationally thinking person, actually takes a look at the evidence, they can determine for themselves that we weren't told the truth. Now, for me, and my attitude used to be different on this, but it's changed. But for me, you don't really need to go any farther than that. Where I think we get into problems and where, where issues come up is when... Everyone wants to get into arguments over the minutia of it, you know, how they did it, how it was pulled off. Did they do this? Do they do that? The, the honest truth of it is we're never really going to know. Right. Do we have enough evidence to support the idea that it wasn't what they told us it was? Absolutely. Now, do we have enough evidence to say, because I, I'm also one of those people that thinks it's kind of simplistic and kind of um, marginalizing to just assign blame totally to the United States government. If you look at it, there were definitely more hands in that pot uh, than just the United States government, foreign governments, other uh, intelligence assets throughout the world, Israeli Mossad, British intelligence, etc. I think that, um, yeah, the majority of people do, I think now, feel that something is wrong and was wrong with 9-11. But I, again, I think the problem is, is that everybody wants to argue over how it happened in, in the minutia of it. And I think that's where we get into issues because, um, you know, people start to get into, I've seen it happen a lot, they get into division because one person has their theory about how it happened, that conflicts with another, people get in, you know, uh, mudslinging matches and whatnot with each other, and we really haven't gotten anywhere, we've just got more division, and in a way, that's what I think the powers that be want. So, any of these events you look at, it doesn't matter what it is, from the Kennedy assassination on to the modern day stuff, there's always little uh, breadcrumbs and, and whatnot that are left there, for people to follow sort of in that conspiratorial way. And I think in some cases, 
some of this stuff is put out so we get led down these rabbit trails and whatnot. Really, the most important thing, again, I think, is for people to focus on the fact that we weren't told the truth and go from there. If we weren't told the truth about 9-11, what else weren't we told the truth about? And that's something I've encountered in my work into uh, the lost secrets. You know, we start to find things that once you pull back and reveal this question and you say, well, why, wait a minute, you know, why would the Smithsonian Institution hide artifacts from the general public? Why would they do this? Once you get down that rabbit hole, then you start to realize that it starts to ask all sorts of other questions that pertain to the whole grand scope picture of history, who we are, how we got here on this planet, and the rest of it. So I think it's important that people are, are looking for answers, Jimmy, but this thing where you know you, you have to believe what I believe about 9-11, otherwise you're with the bad guys, I think it's a very dangerous route. I was reading today uh, 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 a blog from a scientist, totally unrelated to 9-11 and everything. I mean, it, I was, it had to do with, with uh, research and star temperatures. Okay, so, But I'm on his blog, and I'm reading. And believe it or not, he, he, there was this interesting paragraph where I stopped and I read it like three times. And, and he was referring to different scientists and how they do their research and and the politics that are involved and and how one scientist doesn't agree with another one and 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 it could be just one guy saying no and five guys saying yes but but the public and that will will side with the guy that says the one guy that says no and and that he feels that there are conspiracies in the science community right and then he's and, but but he said the word conspiracy and I thought wow that's kind of strange coming from a scientist that even they deal with this, right? Well, anyway, then he wrote, and this is what he wrote. I wish I had it in front of me so I could do a, a quote here. But he said, every politician, every government, every politician, every government, every monarchy throughout history is involved in a conspiracy to stay in power. Everyone, that, to say that, that we don't have conspiracies today Every politician in government is involved in a conspiracy right now. And I stopped and I read that and I thought, wow, that's kind of a heavy thought because it's probably true. <laughs> well, I mean, the evidence definitely supports that. I mean, I, look what, at what's yeah, around. What, uh, whatever I mean, it's about. Maybe it's about trash collection out right. front and, and he, what, whatever, what, just whatever, whatever. But it's how they work. You know, it's it. That's it. It's it's how they work. When I was on Carrie's show, you know, Carrie, uh, I, I know people want to, uh, you know, talk about, you know, nuclear devices or they want to talk about uh, uh, blasting caps or they want to talk about jet fuel. or They want to talk about hologram right. airplanes and they want to talk about, you know, dead bodies that weren't there and what, what all these different views. And I this is exactly what you just said. None of that matters. How and when we'll never find out. All that matters is that the government knew before it happened. That's it. After that, all the gloves are off. And that is the most important thing here. I don't know if we'll ever find out the truth, but we do know that they knew. And that is what makes me uncomfortable, period. Absolutely. And that, you know, you mentioned uh, just a minute ago about, you know, being the day after 9 11 or something, people, uh, not feeling comfortable mentioning this, I remember the, the day it happened. And as soon as the second plane hit, I said, you know, I, just from my research into JFK alone, I said, this is another Kennedy. I mean, they're going to have their patsy rolled out here in 10 minutes on the screen telling mm -hmm. us who to blame for this. And of course they did. And really, I'll be honest with you, Jimmy, friends of mine at the time, I mean, we got in, we almost came to blows over it. I mean, I had people, you know, oh, don't bring that Kennedy stuff into this, blah, blah, blah. But as you mentioned, People don't <laughs> people don't say that to me anymore. You know, I, I haven't gotten that in a long time. And again, I, I think all of the, the 9-11 stuff, I think it's important um, to seek the truth. I think it's important for people to look into it, research it. Please don't take that the wrong way and think I'm telling you not to look into it. You definitely should. But um, just really believe in yourself and believe what your own intuition tells you about things sometimes. I don't get into trying to um that's the one thing people need to know about me jimmy if they've ever uh, listened to me before and you told me the same thing about yourself before we even did the show is that you know you don't have any sort of agenda in any of this you're not trying to you know work backwards from proving your own pet theory i'm the same way i'm not trying to um justify the existence of a religion or 
uh, myself or any belief I have. I'm strictly a researcher, an independent person that's trying to find the truth. And I think that once you get down to the bare bones elements of simply looking and trying to find out what the truth is, everything else seems to fall away. And I think that's an important thing that people need to remember. Could you imagine uh, the world of the 60s uh, through uh, with Kennedy if the Internet was around back then? You know, if there was knowledge and access outside of ABC, CBS, uh, NBC, and Time magazine, right? If, that, because that's where everybody got their news from. And that, that was it. And could you just imagine the, the, the reason why 9-11 is where it is today is because of guys like you and Alex Jones and, and the people that started the, the visibility of a possibility. And, and then it, it, it only continued because there was something there. And people were able to go find that out. Could you imagine what what would have happened in the '60s if the internet was around uh, right after the Kennedy assassination? Well, we'd certainly be living in a completely different world now. That's for sure. I mean, it's that's something that's so unbelievable to even think about, Jimmy. In terms of how different the world would truly be, I, I, I can't even hardly fathom it. But you're right. It seems to me that that what they were missing in that time to really cause a mass awakening was, as you mentioned, the lack of outlets, you know, the lack of any ability and the lack of the ability for the people to even try to get the truth out there on their own. And um, what we have, we have that ability now, but what we lack that they had is the groundswell, the people. Uh, people are a lot more um, enamored with media and, and every kind of entertainment sports these days, a lot more than they were then. And it's gotten to the point where it's just made people complacent. So, I think that they had, you know, issues in their day. We have them in ours, but a lot of the same stuff is there. I mean, we're still kind of up against the same obstacles. People are still looking for truth now the way they were then. Um, I just think that now the technology has gotten to the point where it creates so much more distractions that even when you do have people interested in this stuff, it's very hard to get people to be any kind of actually involved just because a lot of them are really scared. You know, you live in Texas, and uh, Texas has got, it, it could be its own country. We say it all the yeah. time, but there's a different attitude that goes on in Texas. And you don't badmouth America in Texas. You don't, you, don't, right. you don't go against the American way. And by the way, uh, I saw a headline today. Uh, I don't know if it was on ESPN. I forget where I, I read it. But it said, America's team is no longer the Cowboys. It's the Denver Broncos. I was like, man, you really you want to cause a revolt in Texas? What are you doing? <laughs> did you see that? Did you do you see no. that today? No, I did not. Oh man, I just thought you know you really want to you you want to cause trouble? Yeah, yeah. Post that headline. Um, but yeah, in, in Texas, it's it's a bit different there, isn't it? It's a different way of life. Yeah, it is. Uh, but there's not you know the thing about it is not everybody is the, like the stereotypical Texan that you meet. I mean, we're not all. We're not all like that, uh, which is a good thing. There's a lot of, you know, really enlightened, intelligent, next-level people that live here, just like anywhere else. I mean, it's the same thing where you live, Jimmy. Not everybody that's, you know, from California is the stereotypical Californian. It's just part of it. But um, you're right. I mean, there is that thing about, uh, you know, this connection to Texas and this connection to, you know, America and patriotism. And, and you know, I remember uh, Jim Mars once telling me um, that in the early uh, – early days right after Kennedy was assassinated when he was a reporter for the Fort Worth Star Telegram that it wasn't even polite in those days to even talk about the Kennedy assassination or to even bring it up at all, much less to even, you know, I insinuate in any way, shape or form that there was something other than the official story. And so that shows you how far we came. I mean, people were talking about 9-11 and talking about, you know, what it was the day it happened and right after it. So in that way, you can see where we have definitely come a lot farther because, uh, again, people have this ability and this thing now to speak their minds more than they did. And as you mentioned, Texas, I mean, we do have sort of a, uh, uh, you know, a certain attitude and so that comes from down here. And I, again, I think that's why there's uh, so many people like myself and whatnot that come out of here that are researching this because uh, we kind of feel, uh, some of us anyway, feel kind of born into it. Like we were, you know, supposed to, 
exist in this part of the world at this time to, to talk about this stuff because there's so few people out there that are willing to put it all on the line and delve into those places that are, you know, at times uncomfortable. But uh, that's what I'm willing to do. What's your position on Sandy Hook? Uh, you know, that's one that I think is, again, kind of just like the 9-11 thing. I think it's another one that the evidence speaks for itself. If you look at the evidence and you look at what it is, um, you know, absolutely, it was some sort of uh, operation. I mean, the, the anytime you see drills, uh, of course, happening at the same time as a real event, that's a, that's a good indicator. But again, I think it is another one of those honeypot situations where they want us arguing over the minutia of it instead of asking hard questions to power and asking to the people that were involved in it, you know, demanding answers. Instead, we're fighting between us and bickering between ourselves over, you know, who's got the pet theory and whose is the best and which is closer. And again, I think those things don't do anything but serve to distract and to serve to keep us spinning our wheels so we don't look and anticipate what the next thing they're going to do is. Because, I mean, look at how many were happening and were coming right on top of each other around Sandy Hook. That's why they, were, they had so many different events that happened around that time right on top of each other so that while a set of people over here is analyzing this event, they're already moving on to the next operation. And that's something in my work that I've always tried to do. I never spend too much time focusing on what the mainstream media is telling, telling us to focus on at this time. I'm busy looking at seeing well, what's going to happen next so that we can hopefully anticipate that and give people warning and people can understand that when they see something happen, that they knew was going to happen, they knew this, they saw the writing on the wall, and then it happens. That is an indicator that you as a person are now paying attention on a level that's different than the rest of everybody out there. You are now have the ability to look at things and almost anticipate when they're going to happen. And that doesn't take a, a crystal ball or anything else. It just takes paying attention to what's going on and looking for the signs and the signals. Well, what would the uh, the... Okay. Gun control, right? They want to take away our guns. That was the intention of Sandy Hook. That's what the Sandy Hook truthers are going to, uh, that's what, that's their position. But obviously that didn't happen. And if Sandy Hook, look, look at Texas, you live there. What would cause the great people of Texas to lay down their arms? Oh, gosh. Nothing. <laughs> nothing. I mean, I, I can't think of one conceivable thing. I mean, uh, nothing. I, nothing. I, yeah, nothing. 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 It ain't going to happen. And I, no. I, and I could say that I, I, I'm comfortable in looking at the entire country the same way. That is one. Talk about a God given right. <laughs> well, that's one right there that we will never give up. And so, why. Why use Sandy Hook or something like that for a, a, an attempt at gun control? It just it it's it's not it's not enough, and I I can't no, I imagine agree. the event that would have to be uh, to force us to lay down our arms, and that's that's the problem. That's the main problem that I have with Sandy Hook. Well, I don't think that it was it, it, a lot of these events are not designed to be one offs, Jimmy. I mean, they're not designed to just have the effect of ju the just one event, they are meant to have an effect uh, you know, uh, that stacks on top of 10 other events like it, 10 other school shootings, Columbine, whatever it may be. They're intended to, over a period of time, uh, uh, basically it's like building a case. It's like you're going to court and you're building a case and you're building your stuff so you can then roll it out and say, okay, here's the evidence, here's to back up why I believe this way. Sure. And I think that that's what a lot of these things are. Uh, it's the same way with 9-11 or the Gulf Wars. I mean, people believe that these are just happening for oil. And if you believe uh, that we're committing genocide and wiping people out, and wiping out entire countries just for oil, uh, you're just not getting the whole picture. It's so much deeper and so much larger than that and goes to right to the core of the existence of humans on this planet. And people just overlook it. So I don't think that the gun control thing, even though that's an easy sort of um, scapegoat, while it may serve to, uh, you know, enhance the people who want gun control and to sort of strengthen their side on at, for a small percentage, I think more of what it has to do with are the of the ability to be able to pull off that kind of a hoax in broad daylight in front of people's eyes and have people just believe it one hundred percent. Nine eleven, of course, was a good example of that. But I think the more that they do this and the more they get away with it, it kind of pushes the boundaries for them um, because it, it, it does appear that eventually there is going to be some sort of event you could 
equate with a 9-11 or a Kennedy or a Sandy Hook or whatever it may be, that will uh, be so unbelievable they will have to use everything in their arsenal to convince people it's real, whether that's, as some people believe, them staging an alien invasion and getting us all to band together to fight these phony aliens. Who knows? But I definitely think that that's what Sandy Hook and all these events are. That They're not really important so much on their own, even though we're told, oh, this is absolutely for gun control. This is absolutely because they want to come after your guns. Well, you know, maybe a little bit. But I think the most important thing for people to realize is to look at these events not individually – look at them stacked together, and look at what the end result of, say, well, look, we had a Sandy Hook, and we had this, and we had that. You know, this is why we need to justify this thing over here. It's All of it is to just justify uh, whatever their next operation is going to be. Well, the question is, has the government ever lied to us? The answer is yes. When? Every day. Okay? Every single day. I, I, I just think... If, if when it comes to gun control, if I don't know what they are thinking, if I'm going to give a tip to Washington, they're going down the wrong road. I don't understand why they're sitting around and contemplating this. And I can understand uh, the intention, of course, of course, to control the masses. I get that. I understand that. But it's not working is my point. They, they need to come up with another plan if that's what they intend to do. And I don't, I don't know what, what plan it would take. Like I said, what would it take in Texas for everybody to get the late? late? Nothing. So I, I just don't understand. Well, I think that it's really more than anything is if, what I look at is all of this stuff that's been going on over the past uh, four or five years has all really been actually ever since the first uh, uh, term when Obama came in office. It seems that a lot of the news stories and a lot of things that, that the government has done and governments around the world have done have been to an int intentionally inflame the people. And uh, that's something I've been monitoring for a long time. I think that that's part of the goal. They want to uh, enrage the citizens. If they wanted our guns, they would have came and got them a long time ago. The fact of the matter is they want people to have guns. Um, think about how much money the arms makers and the people who sell the weaponry, who are the same people that provide military weaponry, mind you, think about how many billions of dollars, Jimmy, they made off of scaring people with sa the Sandy Hook or whatever it may be into thinking gun control might happen. It's not even about what are they going to do or what can they do to get people to give up their guns, Jimmy. It's about what can they do to make people scared of the fact that they may come after them. And what did it do? They did it. And it caused a billion-dollar-plus spike in the arms industry. These guys sell weapons. That's what the people at the top do. If they can't get a war funded to sell their weapons, they will use another thing to scare people. You got a black president, you get a Democrat, you get him in there, you get a bunch of school shootings, you get all these people in Texas and everywhere else scared. They may come from the guns and gun sales and ammo sales go through the roof and you didn't need a war to jumpstart your military arms sales and that's what they've done. This is Fade to Black on the Dark Matter Radio Network. I'm your humble host, Jimmy Church. We are talking with Josh Reeves. Uh, Josh, I, I, I want to change, change gears a little bit here. Let's talk about Ebola. And and I had said at the beginning of the show, I don't, I don't know if you heard it, but there's two things right now that they're trying to scare us with. And it's obvious. It's ISIS and it's Ebola. Which one should we be worried about more? Um, I would say we should be worried. Well, here's, gosh, that's such a, that's such a crazy question. Because uh, first off, let's just establish that we, we know, both know and everybody knows out there that they're both BS. I mean, let's just establish that. We know that this is part of uh, their control plan and the way to just scare us, as you mentioned. But I think that what um, is more worrisome than this contrived threat of the new al-Qaeda ISIS is, is the Ebola and not the Ebola itself. I, I've said from the very beginning, because of my research into um, other medical plagues and, and the whole medical industrial complex thing that the Ebola virus itself, if it even exists, um, does, is not what we have to fear. What we have to fear is the people who are going to act and react from the fear as is going on right now where I live. I mean, I can't even go out somewhere, Jimmy, and have dinner without hearing, you know, hearing 10 people have conversations and all you hear is this fear and panic in people's voices here in Dallas. And I think that's exactly what they want. What's they that? want everybody to be in fear of this so that they can then sell 
um, the vaccine. And when you look into who owns the vaccine, GlaxoSmithKline, they own the vaccine to the Ebola. Uh, what else vaccines have they owned through the years? Well, they were responsible for uh, the AZT failed cancer drug that uh, and chemotherapy drugs that actually are what kills you, not the virus or whatever it may be itself. It's the same kind of thing, Jimmy. They want to create a fear and a panic, make everybody thinking they may catch it so they can get everybody lined up and have forced, forced vaccinations and, and rake in billions of dollars. GlaxoSmithKline is who people need to look at. Look at the patents they own. Look at the uh, vi- vaccine patents they own. And then look at how they've made deals with the CDC, and the CDC owns the patent on Ebola. They did that in 2009. I think people need to fear um, the the fear that they're uh, acquiring from the media more than they need to fear the Ebola itself. And I think that's the same thing with ISIS. Uh, you, could, you could argue it's the same thing. They're creating this phony scare. Uh, again, so they get a reaction out of us, which allows them to basically do anything they want and justify anything they do over – keeping us safe and uh, 9-11 was the same way we'll keep you safe but what did we get we got you know the lockdown we got tracking and tracing we got everything else so again i think it's just like everything else jimmy they get us in fear so they can get us to react or act you know, accordingly what's the word on the street in dallas what's what's the mood like there it must be insane i was just in houston uh last week um and I was, I was kind of tripping on how people were acting in Texas. What's it like in Dallas? Well, I'm a uh, as well as doing radio and stuff. I also uh, uh, sell gems and minerals and crystals and stuff on the side, and we do a lot of events around Dallas. And um, you know, a lot of the events that we do sometimes we do them once a month. And I started noticing that a couple of weeks ago, I mean, right when the Ebola thing started going, all these events that we were doing started dropping off. There started being less people when there should have been tons of people and we started noticing wait a minute you know what's going on here are there you know are there people not coming out we kind of joked about it at first that you know oh maybe people are scared of Ebola or something but now um today i was just reading news stories here locally jimmy about uh yeah people and there are people here in dallas who are panicking freaking out not leaving the house um and again i think it's i think it's unwarranted i think that at this point um again the ebola is not what we have to fear people need to be worried about whether or not they're going to quarantine this entire city uh, with a military lockdown and have forced vaccinations. That's what people should be worrying about, but that's not what they're worrying about. They're worrying about whether or not they're going to contract the Ebola virus itself. So I think what I see here in Dallas right now is a lot of uninformed panic, and um, that's, to me, one of the most dangerous things, that you, you can have uninformed panic and kill more than anything. Do you think uh, the mayor of Dallas has this under control, or do, do you feel like he's – not on well, he's the mayor, uh, and the buck stops there. But how do I? I want to say this with uh, I want to say this with compassion. Not I don't want to sound crazy, but it seems like some crazy mistakes have happened one after another with this. But and were they, they don't mistakes? Have... I mean, that's my thing, Jimmy. Were there mistakes, or were they allowed to happen on purpose? That's right, the thing. right, 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 right. I'm trying to be gentle here, but. And but it seems like I'm not there and we only know what CNN and Fox and everybody else is feeding the rest of the country. I'm not there. You are. Does it feel that way to you? Does it feel deliberate or was this just one crazy mistake after another? No, I don't believe it was one crazy mistake after another. There was too there was too much going on for it to be one mistake after another. They had one case. They had that case in time. They knew what was going on, and yet they voluntarily, in some cases, didn't follow these protocols and these procedures. And, and why wouldn't they do it? If it was serious and it was a real threat, they would have followed those procedures. This is not just bumbling. This is intentional bumbling. Now, it, it, if you wanted to get out there and you were wanting it to escape, what would you do? Well, you, just, you would bumble and, and do those things and not follow those procedures and then just blame it easily on uh, incompetence. And that's, to me, what they've done. I mean, l- luckily, our local uh, ABC affiliate here, WFAA in Dallas, had the foresight to have helicopters on the scene at the uh, apartment a- a- a building where this uh, the first gentleman that, that died was from. And I guess the first day they found him and he came out, he vomited in front of the apartment complex. And the local uh, TV news copter from Channel 8 happened to have the cameras rolling and were able to catch them just with a power washer, power washing the vomit into 
the uh, the drainage, the, the storm drainage, just right into the public water system. No containment at all. No hazmat suits. No anything. That was my first indication, Jimmy, that, OK, they want this to break out. I already knew this, but they want there to at least even if it doesn't break out, they want there at least to be the fear. And they're showing publicly they could have easily not shown that somebody in power could have not allowed them just power washing with no containment out on the airwaves. They allowed that to go out because they want people to be in fear of this because, again, who benefits, follow the money. It's that same old thing. I remember I did the same thing that you did. I, I watched the uh, the helicopter footage over the apartment. I, I was glued to the TV. And the one thing, and I commented on this show about the, what I'm about to say, which is this. The one thing that I would expect as an American with our federal government, the apartment is right there. We know this. Where is the insane hazmat convergence? I want to see a hundred hazmat suits running around. I want to see a total lockdown. I want to see all those other apartments emptied. And they waited and waited and waited. And I, I just, I, I was in shock. You would have thought I expected the exact opposite. The 180 degrees flip flop from what was actually happening from what should have happened. And it was shocking to me to see the slow response. I did. I, I still don't understand why. Well, I, uh, you know, I, I immediately knew after researching who owns the patent on the vaccine and all that stuff. That immediately, okay, this is this is like AIDS or cancer, where you know they tell you that the symptoms of this are, um, you know, your immune system breaking down, whatever it may be. But then they give you the drugs that are supposed to combat it, and then the drugs give you the side effects: the, the losing weight, the hair falling out, whatever it may be. And uh, last week, whenever this gentleman here uh, that had the first case of Ebola in Dallas, they, their news came out on a Monday that uh, he was being given that day the experimental Ebola vaccine made by GlaxoSmithKline. And I said, right then and there, I said, right there, he'll be dead by tomorrow. Because, again, it's not the Ebola that's going to kill you. It is going to be the vaccination or the cure that they offer up that is going to cause the massive outbreaks and the massive deaths. And of course, the very next day, Jimmy, after they gave him that vaccine, he died. And that's, uh, to me, that's where the fear needs to be placed. And the fear is not being assigned to the right place. It's being assigned in the place it doesn't need to be. People are not concerned with what they should be concerned about this whole deal. And to me, that's what scares me the most about being here in Dallas, Texas. With, with Obama, do you think uh, he should have allowed uh, those first two doctors into the country? You know, I mean, who's to say that? It, I, mean, I don't know. I'm just one of those people, Jimmy. I, I, don't, I don't give just like I don't give the government uh, all the credit or all the uh, responsibility for doing 9-11. I, I don't really give Obama or Bush or any of those guys credit for all the uh, the things that they do. I think it's definitely above their heads. It's hard to say. I mean, I, I don't want to pin this on Obama any more than I want to pin 9-11 on Bush. Were they involved or were they in the power structure? Sure. But um the guys that make these calls are generally military. They're they're generally way, way, way above the head of even the, the commander in chief in some cases. So um, I, I, was there an intentional um, – I think they intentionally did, yeah, let this person in so that this phony scare of this outbreak could happen. Absolutely. I, I don't think that um, this all – any of this happened by accident. And I, of course, don't think it happened by accident that it the first one broke out right here in uh, in Dallas, Texas at all. Would you lock down Liberia? Whew. Oh man, yeah. I, again, that's the, all. These are tough questions, and I mean, you know, of course, on the, on the surface of it, if you're looking at this from a, um, you know, real world, regular everybody perspective, I think your answer would be yes. But again, um, it, it seems that Liberia was like their test bed, their test ground. It seemed to be um, where they really wanted this outbreak to happen, whether that be for population reduction purposes or whatnot. That's debatable, but uh, for whatever reason. That was where the ground zero was chosen. And, yeah, I mean, I think it, if, if I thought it was a real threat, Jimmy, I'd say yes to that. Um, but at this point, the, the fact of this thing being very, very uh, promulgated and created and uh, used as a fear thing, I, I really don't know what to say. I really don't know whether I would say yes, absolutely, or no. But I think letting people come in here, um, you know, at, at, for anything, anything, letting them come into the country for any reason, 
when you know they may be contaminated with something that has the ability to to break out in large scale, I think is is negligent and definitely uh, needs to be fixed. Yeah, if it is what it is, right? Right. If right. it is what it is, lock it down. Right. If it is what it is, we have the world to think about. You know, I know it it would suck to live in Liberia in a situation like that, but you know what? We there's the bigger picture. So if it is what it is, lock it down. And if you're not then there's something funny here. What are you doing allowing it to propagate if it is what it is? That's, that's the whole issue, Jimmy. I think that's really what we should be looking at in all of this because um, uh, either way, you've got negligence going on here. I mean, we've had um, lockdowns and whatnot for, for stuff. But look at the way that they tried to fear monger swine flu and bird flu and all that a few years ago, and it just didn't work out. And the same companies that we're talking about now that own these vaccines own the vaccines for those as well but it wasn't something where they really got enough people worried about it and i always tell people my listeners jimmy on my show i always tell people you know whatever the the government or whatever the the establishment tells you um just do the opposite of it you know if they tell you uh (laughs) to be in fear of something you need to worry hey you don't, know, don't, don't worry. Don't, right. But, but when they do like they're doing now and you see for the first time ever someone like, you know, um, our governor here uh, agreeing, Governor Perry agreeing with with Obama about the Ebola thing. You're like, wait a minute, this guy, he could Obama could say the sky was blue and, and Perry would say, no, it's red. You're 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 wrong. I mean, he'll argue about anything. <laughs> but on this, all of a sudden, both of them, don't worry, we got this. Right. It's all good. That worries me more than anything. I when you when you watch the news, I already know the answer. I just want to hear you say it in your best, Kennison. When you uh, when you watch the news, is that what you do? Do you flip it over 180 degrees? Is that how you get to the truth? I I wouldn't say I would say I do that every time, you know. But I think I think oftentimes it is. I, I've, I have found that it is good when they say. You know, I don't worry when they say, oh, my God, you need to be panicked. You need to be worried about this. I'll tell people, no, nah, I don't even worry about it. And it turns out that way. But again, when they're saying, hey, man, it's all good. We got this. Wait a minute. Why are you being nice all of a sudden? Usually right. you're telling me to freak out. Why all of a sudden are you telling me to, hey, man, it's cool. Chill out. Have a drink. Kick back. Relax. We got you on this. I mean, these guys can't even balance or keep the, the deficit straight. But they got us on this supposed outbreak. I don't know. I don't know. It's a little fishy. Yeah. Well, uh, t- tell me really quick uh, before we move on. What was that? What was your dad like? What was your mom like? Were they like you? Do, where no. did you get? Where did you get the attitude from? I. I. You know. I don't know. It just came out. Just me. I mean, I just was born different. I, <laughs> my, <laughs> my dad wasn't like this. My my mom's not like it. Uh, nobody in my family else is. I'm just. Uh, I don't know. I'm just a lone wolf. Uh, what do they think about you now? Uh, well, my dad passed away in 2011. Uh, T was uh, at first um, very, uh, he wasn't really on board with a lot of this stuff at first. And, and, and over the years, I got, especially 9 11, and over the years, I got him really, really re- reevaluating some stuff and looking at it. And eventually, I caught him out in the yard one time uh, yelling at the neighbor about Building 7. I kind of had a tear in my eye. <laughs> <laughs> right on, right on. Uh, yeah, my parents, yeah, uh, I was just back from my brother's wedding, and, and I, uh, I'll tell you, they just let the whole ufology conspiracy subject, it was just never brought up. Right. They, 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 no, no, they just, uh, I think they're happy, you know, they're cool in, in a way, but no, they just, uh, no, the subject never comes up, ever. It, it just doesn't come up. Don't you have a show? Don't you talk about aliens? <laughs> You know, it's it's kind of funny, and and uh, anyway, it, it, it because I think everybody's attitudes, like yours, it, it comes from somewhere, and right. and the way that you're brought up has everything to do with it. And I just picture your parents, uh, and not you know, not being radicals, but obviously they had to have a uh, uh, free spirits, you know, open minds to uh, the apple doesn't fall far. No, I, I pro- actually, I promise you, no, it wasn't. It wasn't at all. My parents really no. None of them were ever really into this. I, I started researching UFOs and Bermuda Triangle and stuff like that when I was in the third or fourth grade. Right. And I think that the reason why they never questioned me on it and, and never really said anything to me about it was 
through the years growing up, even into middle school and high school and stuff, was I think they were just happy I was reading something. You know, anything, <laughs> anything. <laughs> you know, I really think that's what it was. They were just they didn't care. Right. He's got his nose in a book. So, all right. Um, uh, we were talking earlier today. This is uh, Fade to Black in the Dark Matter Radio Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. We're talking with Josh Reeves. Uh, uh, we were talking earlier today about Sitchin and uh, the Book of Inky, and uh, I have, and congratulate. I don't know how you how you managed to get through that, but that that was a labor of love. Um, <laughs> and for everybody out there that hasn't read Inky, uh, Josh has got his own. Uh, I want to say book on tape. I don't know how would you how would you even describe that because you read it. But then you, you, you interject. So I don't know. What would you call that? You know, I, I, we just we just call them. You know, we just call them book readings. I don't know. I, there was something that kind of started on my show um, after about a year of, of being on air, and I just I got to this point where I got tired of talking about news stories and new stuff every day, and I just decided to read uh, a book on air once. Uh, the first one I ever did was called the finding of the third eye by Vera Stanley Alder, which I've now read twice. Right. And, uh, it, it, it just was huge. It just went crazy. And so I said, wow, uh, people really respond to that and like that. And so I said, well, um, you know, what else would you like me to read? Give me some requests, you know, send me stuff. And I had never really been, uh, a big person that was into Sitchin. I had studied, um, you know, ancient Sumerian Mesopotamian history and studied all that kind of stuff on my own. But it had never really looked into Sitchin because everybody kind of told me not to, so I didn't bother with it. And one day I got an email from someone saying, you know, can you read this? I think you should read this on your show, uh, The Lost Book of Inky by Zachariah Sitchin. So I said, okay, and I, I read, I did read that book, and I think it took, gosh, it must have took seven or eight months. Well, it's, how many videos is it? I don't even know I got, You know, I don't even know. That's the funny thing, Jimmy, is that um, that thing has actually gone on to be the biggest thing I've ever done. It's gotten more hits than my own videos on my own channel have. It's just went completely bonkers on its own, as well as the uh, reading of the Emerald Tablets of Toth that I did. There's several of them out there, but uh, I, every time I get an email from somebody, a new listener, everybody wants more of that. And it's, again, one of those happy accidents that I just did, um, you, you know, just because somebody asked me to do it. But I really learned a lot from that reading of um, the Lost Book of Inky by Zachariah Sitchin. And what I do in there, and as you mentioned earlier, you know, people... Um, uh, what I do is not PG on my show. I'm happy to go on anybody else's show and be completely G rated. But, uh, on my show, we open it up and get pretty raunchy and, and get in there. And the, uh, the Sitchin readings are no different, but we like to inject humor and like to inject some stuff in there to kind of take the gravity off because some of these topics that you get into are so heavy and, and can weigh on your mind and your heart so much sometimes that it's kind of good to have the comic relief a little bit in there. And um, that's what I've tried to do with these readings. But I was just really shocked, Jimmy, when you mentioned that you were familiar with that uh, reading there. I listen to it all the time. <laughs> I, I, I really do. I really do. And and I'm, I'm suggesting to the audience right now, just go do your YouTube search, Josh Reeves, Lost Book of Inky, and start with uh, part one. And good luck to you. <laughs> it's... Uh, it's it's uh it's very 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 cool. Some you're right though. Some of it uh, really makes me crack up uh, because you'll just stop and 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 and, and comment and uh, it's it's colorful. It's not G rated, <laughs> no. but uh, but it's very cool. So now let's uh, let's stop with Sitchin for a second because okay. I know that you researched all of that uh, the Sumerian culture. Then you read Sitchin. Um, are you absorbing Sitchin as you read it? Um, and does it stay with you? Uh, and does it conflict with your previous research? I mean, how do you come out of the other side? Well, I think that when you listen to it, uh, when you listen to all those readings, Jimmy, it really, uh, you really see how I come out on the other side, which is, um, what I do is, is I confirm, like when I hear something, when I hear him on the right track and I hear, him talk about things that I can, with my own research and my own reading, confirm to be true, I'll let you know that. At the same time, if I hear something that conflicts with it and I think is, you know, in my opinion, BS, I will let you know that too. I'll, I'll just be upfront about it. So I think that, that for me, um, I, I didn't really come out on the end, on the end of it um, liking Sitchin any more than I did going into it. But I feel like that I had... Um, elements of the bigger picture and 
things that I was kind of on the cusp of finding myself um, that I kind of got the puzzle pieces for a little bit more. So I, I, you know, I did get something positive out of those, out of those experiences, but I didn't walk away, um, you know, a die in the wool believer. Because the fact of the matter is, those texts and those uh, writings exist. They do exist. There, there are actual Sumerian texts. There are actual clay tablets. These stories do exist there. But um, just because I see this a lot, and it's a problem, just because somebody is, you know, a goofball or a clown or you know whatever it may be you want to call them, doesn't mean that they might not have some truth mixed in with their goofballness. And I think that that's the, the whole shoot the messenger thing is the problem with a lot of research. A lot of people um, will overlook certain areas of research or certain piece of information they should be into strictly because they don't like the person delivering it. And of course, you know, I personally, I've ran into that. There are people that don't like me and don't like my style or whatever, but then that's fine. But the fact of the matter is if you actually listen to my research and you watch my films, and you look at where I'm going with this stuff, you will get something out of it. You will gain something you didn't have before. I always try to uh, take people to those places that are, you know, sometimes scary to go down, but I'm willing to go there in the name of the research because that's the number one most important priority to me. And I don't try to beat anybody over the head with anything, Jimmy, or get anybody to think like me. I always encourage people to take what I've done, look at it, research for themselves, and, and come to their own conclusions because at the end of the day, that's what matters, not what somebody tells you to think. Well, before you, I don't want to belabor this, but I, I do want to, I want to be clear. Uh, before, did you flip-flop on Sitchin? In other, no. Okay, explain. Well, I, I, well, I don't understand what you mean. I mean well, I what I mean is uh, before well, your stance on Sitchin, bef- uh, has it changed over the years? Is, is that what I, I guess that's where I'm no, going. I, I think, no, I, it hasn't changed, not one bit, because I've always, from the beginning, seen him and a lot of other researchers and people out there. Um, again, it's just like rat poison. You know, a good percentage of rat poison is grain that won't hurt you. It's that other couple of percentage points in there that is what kills you, and that's, that's that way with Sitchin with a lot of researchers. I mean, a lot of what he says is true and can be verified, but there's a lot that can't. So what I feel my job is to do with these readings that I've done of the Sitchin books, and I've done three or four just because people have asked me to do it, but what I do in all of those uh, is, again, I go in there and I, for people who don't have the years of research that I have to be able to discern what is the good stuff he's telling you and what isn't, that's where I come in and with my comments I interject and say, hey, you know, he's, I'm going to give him credit here. He's right on. This is right. This verifies this. But this over here, uh, specifically the big one I have with him is the Nibiru thing. Right. Um, I, I I, that's where I was going right that's, now. Okay. That's so. where that, that's where I part ways with him as far as the theory. To me, when I because when I read the the actual text and the translations, that that thing is not in there, or at least the way that he interpreted it to be is not in there at all. And that does absolutely seem like it was some sort of. Uh, fabrication to fit an agenda or something else, but um, where do yeah, you, that's where do the you, big one. Yeah, I, and I'm with you. I'm right there as you you and I are eyeball to eyeball. Where did he get it from? Was it, well, you know, I mean, it, it had to come from somewhere, or, or was it just totally fiction? No, it, no, 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 no. It's it, look, it, it's in there, but the way that he that he presents it as being there as being this. Um, you know, this planet that comes around every so often and this was the home of them and it's going to return and all this. Uh, it doesn't really seem to be presented that way when you read it. It seems to me to be something more like, um, you know, maybe more like a ship or maybe something like a, um, a supernova that exploded at some s- certain time. I mean, there is so much gray area for interpretation in there of what it can actually be that for any one person to build a career off saying it's absolutely this without anything to back it up, it needs to be pointed out. Right. And with, with all of the ancients, pick out a civilization. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I don't care if it's Chinese, Peruvian, Mayan, Egyptian, Sumerian. Pick, pick somebody. Pick, I, I, it doesn't matter. Northern Europe. It doesn't matter. Pick, pick something out. Everybody mapped everything. That's all they did was look at the sky and look at the stars. They knew. I don't know how they pulled it off, but they had everything figured out. And what hasn't been confirmed is no other society has has uh, mentioned uh, Nibiru um, at all. 
If there, right. if it was somewhere else in some other ancient text, we could all say, you know, aha, okay, because they all knew about Jupiter, Mars, the constellations, um, uh, astrology, astronomy. Everything was there, and they knew a lot. They knew an awful lot. It seems, it blows my mind when I look, go outside, look at the stars. And think, how did they know this 3,000 years ago, 5,000 years ago? How did they know? Because I look up and I just see stars. Right. But they were able to do that. And the one thing that is missing is Nibiru and yep. um, all the other text. The only thing that's ever been found, I think, that's been uh, it probably has been used to, be, uh, to misinterpret this Nibiru thing. There was actually a, uh, a constellation, like a glyph. In found in uh, in Iraq in ancient ancient Sumeria that shows our sun it shows our planets in the exact order they are around the sun but it shows two additional planets not one but two and no one's ever really been to, able to explain that did uh, you know as far as we know they didn't have telescopes back then uh, and the rest of that stuff but what's fascinating and people can see this by watching my Lost Secrets of Ancient America film a lot of stuff from the Mesopotamian culture. A lot of um, hints and indicators and things that go back to that have been found all over the world in places like America even. But as you mentioned, what has not been found is anything remotely concerning this Nibiru thing anywhere else. And again, I think it's just been a red herring from the start. But I don't – I want to believe. You know, I, I want to believe. I, I, well, I, I, I want to – let me throw this at you, Jimmy. I think from my research, there is just as much of a chance that the supposed people who came from Nibiru came from somewhere inside of the Earth as it, they did from outer space. I'm going to put it to you like that. Mm, interesting. I just had, okay, we're at the bottom of the hour. Let's just get this out of the way because uh, this next question is very important. This is Fade to Black on the Dark Matter Radio Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. We are talking with Josh Reeves. Uh, Josh, let's talk about the... The, the Wall in Dallas. And I just had on Scott Walter uh, last week. And, and, I, and I know you, you know exactly where I'm going right now. He says natural. Right. Okay. So let's tell us about the Dallas Wall and, and then we'll get to his conclusions uh, after he answer. Okay. Uh, how much time do we have here? Uh, we got all you need. Okay. <laughs> this might take a minute. Um, the, yes, that is something that has been uh, uh, of, of very, very uh, important, uh, large importance to me this year. I started uh, researching and finding out about this Rockwell thing. It's actually not in Dallas. It's actually in um, a town that's in the suburbs of Dallas that's actually called Rockwall. And um, that's actually a, a funny thing about that is, too, Jimmy, that's actually where uh, Alex Jones is actually from. He grew up and went to school in this town, Rockwall, and um, underneath this town, and back in the uh, when it was first, even before it was incorporated as a town, they found this. Um, every time they tried to dig up water wells in this town, they would get down to the bottom and they start hitting rock. And there's um, even people at the time knew that there are is no zero, I, absolutely zero, naturally occurring rock in this entire area of North Texas. It just geologically is not a place where there is any natural rock. So any rock that's found in this area had to have been brought in from an outside source. And they started finding all these rocks. They started finding um, evidence of this mortar substance that was between these rocks. They knew it was old. And um, two of the, the founding members of the town before it was named Rockwall, they were kind of all arguing over who was going to name We just went, uh, I just lost signal. So everybody just stay with us. Keith, run some music. This is Fade to Black on the Dark Matter Radio Network. All right, everybody, welcome back. Fade to Black on the Dark Matter Radio Network. Another, you know, little glitch, not that big of a deal. Josh is with us. Josh, how you doing? Everything good? Oh, yeah, I'm good to go. Okay. All right. We were right at the good stuff. We were talking about. Um, uh, Sitchin, and I don't believe. Oh, we changed gears and we yeah, went we to were, the Dallas Wall. Yes, I remember exactly where we're at, so it's it's fine. Okay, so then let me ask you this question really quick: um, Are you suggesting that there's nothing but dirt when you say there's no rocks? Uh, well, uh, help me out with that thought. 
Well, there's there's no uh, naturally occurring rock in the air. I mean, of course, there's bedrock. If you go down past the dirt, there's uh, re- bedrock. But what they call what they call this soil here is uh, uh, post diluvial soil. I mean, it's you know it's soil that washed in from somewhere uh, after this massive flood event, which definitely ties into this rock wall thing. But um, the, the long and the short of it is, yeah, the question you asked me was. Um, tell people what the rock wall is if they don't know about it, and then, you know, give my take on the, the America and Earth thing. But um, the, with, with the wall, basically what it is, if people don't know, uh, it's a 20-mile diameter structure that's buried under the town of Rockwall. Don't send me 100 emails asking me how you can go see it. I get Every time I go to a show, I get 1,000 emails. How can I go see the wall? You, you can. It's buried uh, underneath the town. That Much of the town is built on top of it. It's a 20-mile diameter structure. That is, and a lot of these things really indicate what I'm about to tell you. Indicate my problem with the American Earth Show because a lot of the evidence that uh, is known about this wall was not even allowed to be brought to the table on that broadcast. Things like it being leveled uh, at 550 feet above sea level, the entire structure. The only way you could have done that would have been to, by hand and you know manually, go in. And level this thing before it was built. No matter how the terrain changes, the wall itself sits at 550 feet above sea level. It, uh, it's made up of, and this is the main thing, they did not introduce into the show the um, makeup, the uh, stone makeup, and the, more, more probably the crystalline makeup of this rock wall. They did not introduce this information at all. They had uh, a dig. Why didn't they do the testing on the stones at the dig. Instead, they do the supposed test on stones that could have came from anywhere on someone's property that didn't actually come from, uh, may not have actually come from the rock wall, but what they were, they were stones that were, as they say in the show, taken from the 1976 dig that were taken from very close to the surface of the, uh, of the wall itself. Now, when excavations have been done, it has been found out that somebody much later in history actually added on to this wall, um, much later after it was built, the estimates of the wall put it somewhere in the range of uh, 220,000 years old. This has been based on uh, a lot of the uh, uh, analysis that's been done on the stones and the uh, different dating, but that was the main crux of the issue for America on Earth. They did not reveal what the wall is made out of. They tried to say, oh, it's limestone or this. It's actually uh, been analyzed multiple times since 1945 all the way to 1999, and in every case, they find that it's made of zircon, garnet, um, tourmaline, rudel. It's also made of an uh, element called starlight. And then it also has some rare earth elements in it, titanite, brookite, and also one called niobium. Now, niobium is interesting, and that's one of the more interesting things about this wall, is the structural engineering that went into this is beyond what in many cases we have even today and things like the entire structure being built with a buttressing effect meaning that this wall has built into it the ability for it to withstand live loads live live heavy big things on top of it for sustained periods of time it also produces piezoelectrical energy this is a result of the uh crystalline compound and makeup of the stones which is exactly why the america on earth thesis of it being a natural formation does not fly because all of these elements that are ground up to make these cast stones of the wall, titanite, brookite, tourmaline, starlight, rudel, zircon, all of them, they all form naturally in nature on a host matrix, meaning tourmaline forms on a quartz matrix, uh, on and on and on. These stones exist in a ground up form, not on their natural matrix in the these cast stones of the wall. Now, if someone extracted all that from stone, there would be literally millions of tons of just quartz rock left over. So somewhere there's got to be a bunch of discarded quartz, right? Well, that's where the geopolymer mortar substance that's been analyzed, and that's what they called it when they analyzed it in a lab, is the geopolymer mortar substance. It's made of three different types of quartz crystals, all brought from different locations around the, the globe, and then mixed together to make a waterproof seal that these stones are sealed together with. And because of their quartz matrix, you can never do an accurate paleomagnetic data on the rock wall. Now, that's their main crux in the show, is that they did paleomagnetic data 
uh, survey on the wall, and that if it was a natural formation, that all it would be completely um, uniform, and that if it was an unnatural formation or man-made, the uh, signature electromagnetic signature of the wall would be just going everywhere nuts because you'd have all these pieces brought in, so it wouldn't be uniform. Well, what they didn't introduce into the show, what they didn't bother telling people, is that quartz itself, anything that has any large amount of a quartz material in it, can never be properly analyzed during a paleomagnetic data survey. Because of the nature of crystal, of quartz, it puts out a magnetic signature that will always give you a false positive when you do a test on it. Now, they also didn't mention that the guy who originally did the paleomagnetic data survey back in 1999, a gentleman by the name of Dr. Wolf Goss from the University of Texas, um, got so freaked out when he did the paleomagnetic data survey that he won't even allow his findings to be published until after he's dead. Hmm? But all, this, all of a sudden, American Earth is just okay with, you know, they're able to get one. No, they didn't give accurate information. People can go to my website and uh, theglobalreality.com, and when you go under the tab where you can buy all my documentaries and movies there, there's a tab that says um, Bud Shelton's Geological Report, and you can click on that, and it's a free download. It doesn't cost anything. And one can read that entire paleomagnetic. It's got all the paleomagnetic data. It's got all the geological data concerning the rock wall. And bear in mind, the person that wrote this believes the rock wall himself to be a natural formation. But he says it explicitly in there, that paleomagnetic data on the rock wall, such as what is conducted on America and Earth, cannot be accurate due to the large quartz makeup of this geopolymer mortar substance that butters these stones exactly as a stonemason would do. Um, going back to the structural engineering thing, you know, it being leveled at 550 feet above sea level, the buttressing built into it, but also this uh, element niobium. Now, if people look up niobium, they'll understand that we didn't even learn how to use niobium until the late 1800s. And what we use that for now is strictly structural engineering. It's an element that you can combine with other metals, other elements that acts as a huge conductor. If you were doing any kind of activity producing energy or anything like that that would produce as a byproduct a large amount of heat, adding niobium to it allows you to be able to perform that process without getting the excess heat that is produced by it. This rock wall contains in large amounts niobium. That is a structural engineering element we use in skyscrapers. We use it in big pipelines. We use it in spacecraft. Anything where we need it to be absolutely reinforced and withstand heat, we use niobium in. Now, how come these things were not allowed to be on that show? The rock wall is not an open and shut case. They have been attempting to cover this up for years. They didn't try to even have that show until after I released the first ever movie about it in 2013. And uh, the cover-up continues. But the fact of the matter, what people need to know is, is that it is not what they told you it is on there. And if you watch my films and, and listen to the stuff that I talk about, you'll be able to see the evidence of that. With Scott, oh, I have 20 questions. Oh, I'm going to do this one first. <laughs> With Scott, wouldn't it have been advantageous to him? I like Scott. I think Scott's, uh, uh, we need guys like Scott that think outside the box. And I know you can appreciate that. But wouldn't it be uh, advantageous for Scott? to show that it was man-made i mean why why go the other route it's not up to i mean it's not up to him i don't i don't just like we were talking about obama or bush or anybody else i don't assign all of the blame or whatever i mean there, the fact of the matter is jimmy even if he himself thought that this thing was a man-made formation wasn't natural he would not be able to put that out on that show I mean, if you watch my newest film, The Lost Secrets of Ancient America, Volume 2, and you find out who actually owns the History Channel, and you look into the history of who, who actually owns it and puts out those shows, you'll see for yourself that, you know, it doesn't matter what Scott Walter believes. And, you know, he's got a big vehicle, but at the end of the day, he's going to have to go with whatever they tell him to go with. And, and I don't know this for a fact, but I have the opinion just, you know, that he probably does think the truth of it is something other than what they've told. But, you know, because of uh, the powers that be not allowing that to be out there, he's got to go with, uh, with whatever they tell him to go with. That's what I think is going on. You say that it's uh, uh, approximately 20 miles. Now, is it a perfect circle? No, it's a, it's a square type structure. Uh, actually, later on, I'll send you uh, I don't have it on me right now, but I can actually send you over a copy of the map so you can see how big it is and see what it looks like. What's in the center? Uh, the town. <laughs> Okay. Uh, well, if, if I 
if it's uh, you know, if we're looking at uh, uh, piezoelectric a- a- mm-hmm. attributes and and other things, uh, I, it seems like it would focus into the center. I mean, is there something significant in the center that would be under the ground? Well, possibly. Uh, I mean, there is there there's I mean there that gets into the realm of speculation, Jimmy. But uh, I mean, there is a. Uh, I mean, what what's they, the intention of an enclosure like that unless well, you're focusing at something into the center? Well, here's another – but here's the thing, though, Jimmy. I, I didn't really give you – I haven't really given you all the information yet. Um, one of the other things I didn't mention on the American Earth Show that I think is a huge fact is that it's been proven beyond any shadow of a doubt that this thing's – one of the purposes of this thing was to be uh, an act as a seawall, meaning the ocean at one point came up right to where – Rockwall is now, and it can it happen at a time when people were actually building structures. Now, how do we know that? We know that because, again, not mentioned on the History Channel, uh, multiple, this has happened at um, four or five different independent digs that have happened through the years since about the 1940s. But in, in every one of them, um, the further that you dig down, this is another interesting thing, the further you dig down, the larger these stones get. And what's been found is things like shark's teeth, shark's teeth embedded into the outside of the wall. Uh, they found, uh, the dig team last time found sand dollars, fresh sand dollars in the bottom that when you cracked them open, had fresh meat in them. They weren't petrified like they'd been there for thousands of years. They were fresh. Hmm. This, this was a wall that served as a, as a, not only a seawall, but an enclosure from some kind of a city. And almost directly in the middle of where it would be, uh, what would be the center of the wall, is the old Rockwall Courthouse. And this is about as close as anybody can get to seeing parts of the wall because they have a few stones from it and a little small effigy of the wall with the stones kind of thrown together with some concrete there uh, in front of the old courthouse. And this is dead center in the middle of where the wall is. And uh, there was news reports of some guys, I think in the late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, finding a tunnel that went from the closest, nearest water source, which is the Trinity River, which runs through Dallas. They found an underground tunnel that led from this water source, the Trinity River, all the way into what they described as a dome-lined rock room, temple room, which now sits underneath this old-timey rock wall courthouse where they have part of the wall at. And um, that's, that's what seems to be in the center. There was some sort of um, these underground chambers. I mean, somebody had the reason to build something, a, a tunnel, where they could get to the only freshwater source around it and do it underground without somebody being seen or seeing them on the outside. Now, what could that be? I, you know, a lot of people have speculated because they found giant skeletons near around uh, the rock wall that possibly this was built as, um, you know, a defensive structure against them. We don't really know. But the fact of the matter is, when I started my investigation into this rock wall, I wanted to see what else had been found around the United States. Was there anything else? At that point, I didn't know. But I wanted to find out if there was anything else like this that had been found anywhere around the United States. And that's kind of where I set my, uh, my research at. I started looking into the giant thing. I started looking into the mound things because we see a lot of those around the rock wall. And, uh, again, I get into all this in, in both volumes of the film. But it's a very, very um, unbelievable thing with this rock wall because it, when you start to get into how it was built, you start to see that the technology it took to build it is beyond anything we have today. And I think that's where the... Uh, intention to cover up really comes from how far how far down is it it goes down roughly a just shy of a hundred feet okay and, down to the bedrock okay and it sits right on the bedrock sits on the bedrock how much dirt is above the the top of the wall oh, what's gosh. the depth uh I mean, again uh, from the dirt from, from the ground from the dirt to the bottom it's a hundred feet so I mean I guess it would be that same amount uh, no, I mean, how tall is the wall? I mean, how much dirt, how much excavation has to occur to get down to this? Oh, uh, well, that's the thing. Um, you would have to, again, you'd have to go down about a hundred feet. Um, history channel said they went down roughly 17 or 18 feet. Right. I mean, no one's even really scratched the surface yet of this thing, Jimmy. Again, um, the, the conclusions that people have come, uh, come to about this thing yet, are not just justified strictly because there there hasn't even been um, a proper dig yet to even document this stuff. That's one of my that's my major goal with this film series, The Lost Secrets of Ancient America. I want it to eventually culminate in um, an, our own independent dig 
that we conduct ourselves with our own cameras and our own people where we document all the stuff that's been found about the wall and we document it and we show it on film because that hasn't been done yet. No one's done that yet. And in my opinion, you're not going to convince anybody of anything until you show them on camera. Look, here's the analysis of the stones. Here's what they're made out of. Here's the piezoelectrical energy output. You know, none of these things have been done and no one has properly documented these yet. And that's kind of what I've made my personal mission for the past 10 years to do. That's why I'm uh, continuing to research this because um, until we at least have the evidence documented in a way where it can be presented to everyone to see, the opinion on it is never going to change. And that's going to take independent people like me and others who just want to do this and want the truth to come out. It's certainly not going to happen or be funded by the powers that be. No, it's not easy to do. I mean, as you know, we did the discovery of the Malibu base out here off right. of uh, the coast of California. And, you know, I get the question every single day, you know, so when are you guys going out? When are you guys going on? You know, well, it's it's not it's easy, easy to do. And there's logistics. You know, we're, we're, we're close, but you are facing the same thing that we're facing out there. You just don't go out and uh, right. show up with a, with a bobcat, with a backhoe, and, you know, start digging in the city of Dallas down I don't know how many feet. Uh, I can't imagine. Um, now... What about the universities? I mean, who and, and how close are you, do you think, uh, to actually breaking ground? Well, the, the problem of, of it is, is not actually, to be honest with you, Jimmy, it's not really hard to find any place to go dig around. And actually, because it's Texas, you actually can go out there and just dig around anywhere. Um, really, we just need somebody. And I actually have been working on this. We have one person who's come forward recently in the past month who says that they have some on their property and would be willing to uh, have a dig be, be done on their property. Really, we just, uh, it's just money. I mean, that's the main thing. We need, uh, as soon as we have a budget to be able to do it and have a budget to be able to rent the equipment and uh, call in the teams of people to come and work on it, you know, we'll be able to do it. But really, that's the main thing and that, that holds everything back. And um, again, we just want to create something where uh, people once and for all can come to their own conclusions on it. At the end of the day, after we have a dig and we get all this evidence documented and we show it on film, at the end of the day, if there are still people that say it's a natural formation, that's fine. But I really, really think that there are just so many amazing things about this that uh, really warrant a further investigation. Really, it does not deserve to just be brushed off as some natural formation when there's so much voluminous evidence to the contrary. Were you able to talk to Scott when he was out there? No, um, it was kind of a funny set of circumstances um, that surrounded that. I actually, I don't know how, I, I don't know how this happened, but um, right around the time when that was going on last year, I just somehow, that information didn't get to me that it was going on. And right around that time, I was getting ready to make my first appearance on uh, on Coast to Coast AM, and um I was, you know, kind of distracted with that and getting ready for that. And I went back a couple of months later and went, you know what? I'll be darned. That that whole thing was going on the exact same time when I was getting prepared to to be on coast to coast AM. So it so it, you know it 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 didn't happen. So I don't know. I don't want to say that that was something intentional on somebody's part or anything, but I I just flat didn't even hear that it was going to happen until it was all over. Uh, he didn't contact you before he headed out there. Wow. No. Huh. And and you know what's funny? There's actually a part in the in the in the uh, American Earth uh, episode. There's actually a part where he quotes me directly, <laughs> quotes me directly, and I never got contacted. So, but again, uh, you know, at first I was I, I'll be honest with you. At first I was kind of, uh, you know, hard on on Walter himself. But looking at this and stuff, I mean, again, I don't to th to say that he has 100 percent control over what the History Channel puts out. Uh, that's giving him too much credit. I think that. You know, I think there probably is a lot of stuff he, he does think contrary to, but, you know, just can't do it because he doesn't have that kind of power. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I asked him that last week. I asked very directly, and uh, I don't want to quote him. We can You can go listen to the show, but I said, you know, uh, how much control do you have uh, about what the show covers? And, and you know, I think he said, you know, it's, it's up to the producers. They write it. Um, you know, I'm giving the stuff, and we go out and do the show. Some of the shows uh, are, I have input on. Some of the stuff I want, you know, obviously the, Ken, the Kensington Ruin Stone is all his. But, you know, it's show ideas and it's, it's, uh, it's written uh, above and away from him. 
And so I can appreciate that. And I think you might be right there. And this story, this show was probably a show. You know, you know what it's, I mean? He was the host of that show. Yeah, I think that's absolutely what the case is. Yeah, I don't I mean, this is not him doing his, you know, thing that he put together on his own network or something or independent. You know, this is being put out by them on their dime. So um, you realistically, I mean, if, even if I was in the same situation, if I was in the same situation to him, it would be the same thing. You know, I wouldn't be able to go on a History Channel show and say the things I'm saying on your show now, Jimmy. I'd have to say things that went in line with what they wanted the show to be about. That's what producers do. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, now, this is uh, the Smithsonian has been brought up on this show now probably uh, the past, maybe past five, six, seven shows over the last week uh, or two. Um, do you think, so I've, you brought it up earlier, so I'm just going to throw it out there now. I have my beliefs, uh, but it's about you. It's not about me. Uh, do you think they're holding back? You think oh, yeah. they're suppressing? <laughs> the evidence is uh, is in spades in that. I mean, that was when I was working. Uh, I started working on the Lost Years of Ancient America, Volume One. It was like a ten year project, but really over the um, couple of years, 2011, 2012, uh, before I released Volume One last year, that was one of the things that I was really getting into when uh, I started writing Volume One. Was looking at how much of my um, What's the word I'm looking for here? How much of my my paths and my research trails always ended with a dead end at the Smithsonian? A very interesting example of that is this um, coin that was found in um, a water well in the state of Illinois. Now, this coin, which people can see in my film, uh, was in the uh, uh, said to be in the ownership of the Smithsonian Institution. It depicted. Um, a strange crowned woman, almost like a Statue of Liberty type of looking woman, uh, with some interestingly undecipherable um, hieroglyphs on it. Now, this coin was found in this well in a soil strata that dated to 220,000 years, right at the same target range as we've had for the rock wall. Now, in the 1940s, there was a giant stone, a two and a half ton garnet stone which is now said uh, by local rock wall sources and people that I've talked to, is now said to be in the possession of a uh, prominent rock wall uh, congressman, former U.S. congressman, Ralph Hall, who just uh, for the first time got out of office this year. He's said to be the one that's in uh, possession of this. Now, this two-and-a-half-ton garnet stone found in rock wall had a type of hieroglyphics that has never been found anywhere on Earth, and they matched identically with the hieroglyphs found on this coin in Illinois that dated to 220,000 years. Now, uh, a gentleman who, uh, by the name of, uh, oh gosh, uh, it's a John Lindsay, he uh, did a lot of the research on the rock wall, did the, the last rock wall dig in 1999. I met with him in 2008 and started getting a lot of information and stuff from him. And coincidentally enough, when I went to his house, one of the first things I saw uh, was a picture of him with Zachariah Sitchin. And I went, okay. This is interesting. So he spent all this time, you know, trying to basically uh, uh, ease me into what I already, you know, the conclusion I'd already come to myself. But one of the interesting things that um, that he had talked about and mentioned, uh, this John Lindsay guy, was that um, the uh, oh gosh, I just lost my complete train of thought. Oh, We're talking about the coin, the rock, yeah, and, the coin and, and the hall. Rock, right. Well, he had gone to the Smithsonian itself and asked to get video and footage of this coin. And they said, sure, we've got it. No problem. Come on down. You can, you can have as much time as you want with it. You can have pictures. I mean, and it was like, oh, wow, this is a breakthrough. This is going to happen. We're going to get hard proof. So he travels all the way to Washington, <laughs> goes to the Smithsonian, and he gets there. And, of course, they tell him, oh, we're sorry. We, we, we don't know where that is. We lost it. Yeah, it's just gone, and we're sorry. And that's happened time and again whenever researchers have found out about specific artifacts and specific items that the Smithsonian has in their possession. And then when they go to get footage of it or hard evidence, it just magically disappears. I mean, there's been stories of them uh, dumping dump truck loads of artifacts into the ocean. They uh, admittedly, whenever they find a, an ancient artifact that has a language on it that they can't identify – that doesn't match some other existing language, they destroy the artifacts. I mean, this kind of practice 
cannot be considered in line with telling the truth. With the rock and the hieroglyphs from the rock wall and the coin, have you uh, compared them yourselves? Yes. You've seen both? Yes, we have both. Both are in uh, Lost Secrets of Ancient America, Volume 1. I would like to see these. Uh, I'd like to see the pictures and the comparisons. I haven't seen the video. Well, I'll send you over some uh, downloads, Jimmy, after the show. Yeah, that's uh, very interesting. And uh, are they identical? Well, they're, yeah, they're, they're, uh, you have to judge for yourself. I don't want to, you know, I'm not going to put that on. I'm going to let you, I'll send you the video and I'll let you go and check it for yourself. And, and uh, I can over, also send over some pictures. And I'll let you check it yourself. In my opinion, they're identical. In the opinion of other researchers that have, have looked at them, yes, they are identical. And again, this, uh, this kind of uh, strange Statue of Liberty looking person, you know, in this ancient coin, again, soil strata, 220,000 years old. There, there's nothing else that's ever matched either one of these other than these two items. And again, this, uh, S- this Sanders stone, this two and a half ton garnet stone, which contained these, uh, you know, being hoisted out. It was actually um, held for a long time in the old Rockwall courthouse I mentioned earlier, where they had the little Rockwall effigy at. It was held in there for a long time. And uh, uh, back in, I guess, in the, I don't know, it was the late 80s or 90s, a bunch of uh, inmates witnessed uh, Congressman Ralph Hall and some of these other guys hauling this thing out of uh, what was then. It was in the jail back when Rockwall was still a small town, the jail and the courthouse. Uh, we're all there. I can remember driving by it when I was a kid, and you could see jailbirds up in the top, just hanging out at the top of it, just right there. So they, you know, you could see anything that was going on around the outside of this thing, and supposedly that's when they saw this heist going down. And uh, the, my sources that I've talked to around Rock and stuff say that you know it's safe, and it eventually it'll it'll come out again. But um, again, any time there ever has been smoking gun evidence of this wall and and whatnot, it always gets suppressed. But what they can't keep suppressed is this mineralogical data that people can see in that uh, geology report and download at my website. That's what speaks for itself. When you see that and you understand that this was not allowed to be put out on that show, uh, that should pique everyone's interest that there's definitely more going on to this than meets the eye. This is Faded Black on the Dark Matter Radio Network, the spoke radio for the masses. I'm your humble host, Jimmy Church. We're speaking with guest Josh Reeves. Uh, I, you want to take some phone calls? Sure. Yeah, let's uh, let's bang some phone calls. 323-825-5045. You can also Skype in at uh, Fade to Black 14. And uh, while we're waiting for some phone calls to come in, have you, uh, let's change gears. Uh, let's have some fun. Have you um, ever seen a UFO? Oh, I've been seeing those things my whole life, really. Uh, that was kind of, actually, it's good that you asked that, um, kind of segues into the rock wall thing, because that's, uh, that was really what led me on to the rock wall thing and made me want to research it because around the, the area of rock wall, I kind of grew up not in rock wall, but kind of on the, uh, on the outer skirts of that. It kind of goes out into the country. You have like Dallas, you have the suburbs and it starts to get, you know, uh, more and more country, the, the farther you go out and my whole life living around the area of rock wall, I, myself, my friends, my friends, parents, everybody, um, always had stories of lights in the sky, seeing strange things. And when I was about 15 or 16 years old, when I first learned how to drive and stuff, my friend and I chased a UFO um, all the way from north of Rockwall, all the way to Rockwall until it got right to where the Rockwall was, and it zoomed at high speed and sped off into the atmosphere. And, um, you know, at that time, we didn't know anything about the Rockwall. And I had had all these experiences and, and knew all these people that had seen stuff around that area. We actually had a missing time um, event, me and the same friend years later, we had a missing time of it near where the rock wall is, where it was one o'clock when we were crossing this bridge. And when we got to the other side of the bridge, we pulled, we were on our way to work and we looked and the, the clock said five o'clock. And we were like, this can't be right. And we called home and we were like, Hey, what time did we leave for work today? And they're like, what are you on drugs? And you left it, you know, 12 or whatever. And we were, we just were in shock. We were in complete shock. So I had all these stories for years, and all these experiences around this area that had to do with paranormal and UFOs and missing time and everything else. And so in 2004, when I was reading Jim Marr's book, the great book, uh, Rule by Secrecy, which is a, a great primer for people who want to get a little bit of all this stuff in one book, I was reading this paragraph in the book, and at the end it said, you know, maybe one day we'll get answers to all the, the questions of the things we seek. Uh, maybe things such as the ancient rock wall in Rockwall, Texas. And that was as much as I had, was just that sentence that said, the ancient rock wall in Rockwell, Texas, and some kind of light went off in my head where I instantly knew that that had some kind of connection 
with all of these UFO signings, missing time, all of this strange stuff that myself and other people I knew have experienced our whole life. I immediately knew that. And, uh, you know, Jimmy, here I am 10 years later, you know, getting ready to, to make my third film on this subject. And I can't tell you that my opinion about that's changed. I definitely still believe there is a major connection to that. Uh, I'd like to welcome Ken. Ken, how you doing? Say hi to Josh hey. Reeves. Hey, Mr. Church. How you doing, Mr. Reeves? How you doing tonight? Hey, doing well. What you got, Ken? Well, I, okay, I, I'm going to try and remain calm. Um, I, <laughs> Josh, I used, to be, I used to be a big fan of yours. I first, first heard you on Red Ice like maybe five years ago or something like that. And I started watching all your interviews and doing all that stuff. And then it was like six months ago, I saw that you were backing off Sitchin. And I was curious what made you stop believing, because I would heard all your, docu- all your interviews before that, and you were a big fan of them. And then all of a sudden, it seemed like you backed way off them. And I was wondering what happened to well, um, a- to make you. Well, nothing. That's absolutely false. I mean, I'm sorry that you uh, somehow took from my, my my statements or my other shows. But anybody that's, I mean, I've got tons of people who can uh, testify to this, that I've never, ever, ever been a fan of Sitchin to the point where you can actually go on YouTube and see a video I made like four years ago where I'm explaining why I'm reading the Sitchin book. And I explain that in that video very clearly that I'm not a fan of his, never was a fan of his, but I was reading the, his work so that because it was important for me, because for years I kind of did what a lot of people do with some stuff. I just, instead of actually reading what he, the guy had to say for myself, I was just dismissing his work altogether based on stuff people had told me. So when someone suggested that I read the Sitchin book, the first one, the uh, uh, Lost Book of Inky on my show, I said, you know what, I'll do that. Not because, and I said this from the very beginning, so I'm sorry that you took it the wrong way, but from the very beginning, I've never been a fan of Sitchin. And I said from the very beginning, look, I'm only reading this for information purposes. I'm reading this so that you know we can see and decide for ourselves, instead of having somebody decide for us, um, what is good about his work, and what is it? And that's was my intent from the very beginning. So I never, um, you know, a lot of the things that I talk about, a lot of the stuff that I get into may give someone the impression that I agree with Sitchin. But again, Sitchin does not own ancient Sumerian research. He does not own ancient Mesopotamian research. That stuff exists without him ever being in the picture. But every time you bring that stuff up, someone has to throw Sitchin in. And it, after a while, it starts to make you think, OK, well, maybe that's what his role is as a gatekeeper is to, you know, anytime you bring it up, someone will just say, well, that doesn't agree with Sitchin. So it must not be true. You see what I mean? And that puts us in a situation where it, 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 with that, it doesn't matter how much new information or new research we find. It becomes this dogmatic thing where Sitchin becomes almost like religion. And if you say anything outside of that. You're, you're somehow a, you know, a heretic, and that's been something I've done from the very beginning. I've called out researchers. I've exposed other people who are not on the right board. Go watch my Secret Right series of films. You'll see all that. But I have never, ever, ever once ever been on board with Sitchin, and I, from the very beginning, have always only used his work as a reference point to point out to people what they should be into and what they should take as the truth and what they should. Okay, so I'm, like I said, I'm trying to remain calm. Um, <laughs> I understand what you're saying about like, you know, it's like, it's almost like heresy to go against Sitchin. But the reason why Sitchin is so great is that academia had this stupid idea of religion and it was translating the whole thing of like the, the Old Testament and all that crap about, you know, God making the permanent. And then Sitchin had the idea that maybe something was being mistranslated. So he went and learned the ancient Sumerian himself and went back and translated all the books. And then everyone started using listen, his research sir, and listen, crapping listen, all I'm over I'm not arguing with you. Listen, I'm not arguing with you on that. There are, a lot of, there are a lot of the scholarly translations of the text that when you go and look at them, they match identically to what Sitchin said. That's not what I'm saying, sir. That's not what I'm saying at all. You're, you're, again, you're trying to spin this into something it's not. The fact of the matter is, I never, ever once in my life was ever 100% on board with Sitchin. I never even touched his work, read his shred of it, until someone asked me to read that book on my show. I, I, I come to my own conclusions, and everything I believe about this stuff comes from the, my own research, not what Sitchin said. If, if what I say agrees with stuff that he said, fine. If it doesn't agree with it, that's fine, too. But you know whether or not he was doing scholarly translations has nothing to do with the fact 
that the Nibiru thing was a red herring and was used as a scaremonger. All right, all right, all right. You made, you made your point about Nibiru. You made your point about Nibiru before. What about the Dogon? Explain the Dogon. If Sitchin just came out of nowhere with this Nibiru, out of nowhere, then how did an African tribe that had no contact with Western civilization come up with the exact same thing? Okay, well, The Dogon don't have anything to do with Nibiru. They they correlate to Sirius. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hey, Ken, I'm I uh, I'm going to address the Dogon directly myself too, and uh, okay, thank you. yeah, yeah. Thank you, Ken. All the best. I stay calm. I stay calm. Yeah, you. <laughs> hey, Ken, it, this is what this show is about. Thanks, and, Ken. Yeah, Josh knows that. You guys have a good night. Yeah, thank you. you too. Thank you. Um, and I'm going to bring in another call here too, um, and and put them on hold, uh, but they can hear us. Um, is this one one thing about the Dogen, and I want everybody to be uh, uh, to understand my position on this. The Dogen didn't have anything to do with Sirius until the British got there, and so the 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 thought of the Dogen and running around in spacesuits and Sirius and the knowledge of uh, a dual star constellation and 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 everything else that that didn't happen. 300 years ago, 400 years ago, 500 years ago. That only happened postmodern times. And uh, now, I, I, I could be completely wrong, but my research says that. And, and that's where I stand on the Dogen. The Dogen, urban legend that has propagated itself. And that's, that's where I stand on the Dogen. I, I know I've just offended so many researchers <laughs> out there. But I again, I want to believe. I would. Right. I would love for the Dogen to, you know, to have been worshiping Sirius and and the knowledge of 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 the stars and 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 stuff that we've only known in modern times. But I, that's simply not the case. All right, I'd like to welcome. Uh, uh, where are you calling? Who's calling? Where are you calling from? You're live on the air. Uh, well, they are there. I see them. Okay, if you can hear us, call back. All right. Um, and and yeah. So yeah, the Dogen and uh, that, that has to do with Sirius and not uh, not Nibiru. Nibiru. Okay. Here's the. As far as I heard that, I've never heard that connection. Before. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. <laughs> Hi, you're live on Fade to Block. Who's calling? Where are you calling from? Hey, this is Rick calling from Vegas. Hey, Rick in Vegas. How are you tonight, sir? Hey, I'm doing good. You can hear me now. Yes, I can. <laughs> Say hi to Josh. Hey, Josh. How's it going? Hey, doing well. How are you, Rick? Oh, I'm doing pretty good. Cool. I can hear you, too. <laughs> hey, uh, so can you touch on earlier about gun control? Um, kind of like the Dogon. Uh, <laughs> I have a few issues with that uh, really being the government's end game because what it'll just end up doing is creating a really great black market and if you're going to get in trouble for having a handgun, well, hey, up the ante, go full broke, get an AK-47. And if there is some sort of uprising with the United States, it would end up being like the you insurgents know, in the Middle East. So if it is, you know, a a plot to take away the guns, what's the end game really? Because the military equipment is far superior to what we have. Okay. Well, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead, Josh. Oh, well, I didn't really have anything to add. I know. I mean, he's, he's exactly right. right. I yeah. Mean, <laughs> I don't think any of us have the, you know, the answer for, for that. You're absolutely right. I mean, okay. They want to take the guns. All right. So, but again, the, the weapons that they have and these ability to be able to, you know, the stuff they have now, where they can tell, you know, how, where a gun was fired from, from miles away. I mean, the, the stuff that yeah. we even know about, Let's just say that much less the top secret military technology dwarfs anything that the rest of the people are out there. So there's got to be something else more to it. And I think that that's one yeah. of those ends of the rabbit hole that a lot of people, Rick, I think are scared to talk about. I think that a lot of this stuff, you start getting to a point, uh, and I got to that point in my research, you know, when I started trying to, for years, you know, figure out who was on top and which was the tip top of the groups and who was really running the show, I started noticing that the farther up that I went up the food chain, the more I got into this area where it didn't, you know, it started to appear, wait a minute, you know, what are these people that are running this, this planet really aren't on the planet itself? And that, you know, that could be an uncomfortable place to go to. And I think that's the same thing with the gun. People don't really want to even think about 
you know, okay, let's say, for instance, you're right. Let's say, for instance, it is all about gun control. I don't believe that, but let's just say, for an instance, they, they, they do do that. What is the end yeah. of it? And I think that it, it, it's going to require, before any of this plays out, it's going to require more of their events. I think the, uh, uh, the merging of religion and science and the doing away with the, the, the dominant beliefs of either one of those uh, into this world science, religion, worship thing, I, you know, I think that's going to be a big one. But I think a lot of things are still going to happen before we're going to know just why all of these things that we've been seeing happen since 9-11 have been happening. I think there is going to be a big payoff, a big end game at the end of it. But I think it's really speculation. Nobody really knows what that's going to be. Yeah, one of the points that I think uh, where Rick was leading with that, and correct me, Rick, if I'm wrong, uh, is it, it, you're just going to create a black market. You know, if somebody wants something, they're going to get it. Whether, you know, look at heroin, look at cocaine, look at any anything that, you know, makes speeding illegal, well, then people go faster. You know, it's just whatever they want to do. Drugs are illegal. Well, there's now a black market for it. Make guns illegal. There's going to be a black market for it. If you want a gun... You're going to get a gun, and there will be somebody out there to supply it for you. And Even in the cities that have illegal handguns, they just make zip guns, and now they just take a, uh, yeah, they just flip a coin and decide whether or not it's going to blow up their hand or if it's going to shoot the person. <laughs> you're, you're, you're right. Yeah, I mean, you can't argue And then that. when you have, and with uh, 3D printing, I mean, I'm sure you guys have seen the videos of how they yeah. do it. They're able to 3D print guns out of uh, high-impact plastic. Yep, yep. I, I think I'm, just like anything, as you mentioned, Jimmy, I think just like anything, you know, anything you put a prohibition on, whether it be marijuana or alcohol or guns or anything else, is only going to make there be more crime, more violence, and, and more of the rest of it. So it's hard for us to think that, um, you know, it wouldn't go the same way, it, or and maybe intentionally, you know, I mean, just to, to enforce the crackdown and to have more of a, controlled police state, whatever it may be. I think that, um, you know, again, this whole idea of telling someone they can't have something always tends to breed more criminality. And uh, just like all the countries that seen major, major decreases after decriminalization of drugs, I think it's the same kind of thing in reverse. Hey, Rick, anything also, else? Oh, no, I was just going to add, um, you know, I have kids, you know, a lot of people have kids and you know that when your kid wants something, you say, no, you can't have it. They want it even more. And then later on, when they want to do something that's even more out of, the, out, of, out of line, you can use that original thing they didn't want as a bargaining tool. <laughs> so, the whole entire, so the whole entire, uh, we're going to take your guns away, it could be just a distraction. And then they go, oh, no, we're, you can keep your guns, but. You know, right. then then, they, then the other shoe drops. Yeah, right. yeah. What's going to be the caveat they're going to add onto that? That's a good point, Rick. Yeah, that's a great point. Rick, all the best, brother. Cool. Take it easy, guys. Thanks. Great call. Great call. Yeah, he, you know, he's absolutely right. You know, look at Elvis. Elvis is a good example. Elvis is bad, right? Let's, let's help somebody sell 20 million records in a couple right. of days. The shaking of the <laughs> hips and everything was just evil, evil to evil. take over America. Yeah, as soon as you tell... A kid, no. They do the exact opposite. I'm a dad. You know, I, I go through it every single day. It doesn't matter. Hey, uh, okay, uh, no, quick station ID. This is uh, Fade to Black on the Dark Matter Radio Network. I'm Jimmy Church. We're talking with Josh Reeves. Josh, you said something right before Rick's call. Who is running the world? Who is really pulling oh, the gosh. strings? Uh, I was hoping you were going to go there, Jimmy. Yeah, I, I, I we got to go there. Past that one. I, 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 <laughs> I, I think about it every single day. You know, politicians come and go, but the agenda stays the same. Right. You know, who, who is, who, who, who's at fault here? Uh, well, that's, you know, that's a great question. And uh, I'm not going to, in any way, shape, or form, pretend that I have the 100% definitive answer for it. Because um, if I told you I did, I would tell you not to trust me because I don't think anybody, I, I really don't. I really don't think any single person knows for sure. And I think everybody uh, is speculating at this point. But I, what I will tell you from based on, that's all I can really give you is based on my own research and based on my own research, kind of what I was saying earlier, um, you know, people get into the normal things where they, you know, they hear what people tell them and, and, you know, you hear a lot of people say that the Rothschilds are the tip top. And uh, that's just 
that's just patently not true. I mean, there are there are, you can actually find that there are levels of control that go well above these groups. What I uh, where I started getting my uh, my start in this kind of thing was back when I first started my radio show seven years ago. Uh, like the second or third show I ever did, I had on uh, former Canadian diplomat uh, Peter Dale Scott, uh, who's written a lot of books on the Contras and 9-11 and the rest of the stuff. And uh, it's just a, a great old guy. Mm-hmm. And I had him on my show and we were talking about, he's my first guest ever. And we were just talking about, you know, the usual groups, you know, the Council on Foreign Relations, the Trilateral Commission, this kind of thing. And he said, no, 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 no. You got it wrong. You know, those those groups are not nearly as powerful as people say they are. You need to look into this group called the Council for National Policy. And I, you know, I'd never heard of that. And he said, this is, you know, they were kind of started in Dallas and, and these guys are really who's, who's running things and they control stuff on both sides, left or right. And I, I had just was shocked because I had been researching for, you know, 15, 16, 17 years at that point. I had never even heard of hiding hair of this group. And then when I first start looking into it, immediately I start seeing names that happen to be names of people who are regular guests on a certain conspiratorial show the you know what would be considered probably the biggest one um and i started well wait a minute here what you know what's this and i started finding that all of it was you know these right wingers when predominantly the research community had always said that you know the people who really ran the world and the people who really were in charge of the top um were of the left wing persuasion and i started seeing all these names that had ties back to um you know, the biggest groups. And and here we are. I'm going, wait a minute. So it's more than just this control. So I started looking into uh, the priest class, the religious elements that control uh, world groups, your think tanks, stuff like the uh, Royal Institute of International Affairs, the Fabian Socialist Society, all this stuff. And I made two films on this group, the the Council uh, for National Policy, Secret Right Volume 1 and Secret Right Volume 2. And those are on YouTube. People can watch them for free. And um, that's where I started getting to, okay, I want to find out who's behind all this. And really, the, uh, the biggest revelation that I can really impart to people is that when you go back through the centuries and you go back through the levels of control, you find one thing for sure. In the earliest incarnations of government, the priests were the government. They, you didn't have presidents and kings and queens and, and you know, congressmen and senators. They had priests. The priests were in charge. The priests were the ones that delineated the information or the knowledge that supposedly came from the gods and then ruled over society with that. This is how the first uh, civilizations in ancient Mesopotamia and Iraq were set up. And as you, when you learn that and you start to work backwards from that, then you start to see these tentacles of religious control uh, go through all of the different groups and think tanks that exist in this modern day. And then when you find out things like the, uh, the secret society network, stuff like where, where, what spawn groups like the Freemasons and uh, the Los Alambrados Society, which later spawned uh, what people know as the quote-unquote Illuminati and things like that. When you start to find out that these original groups, which originated even prior to Freemasonry, um, back to the Pythagorean mystery schools, and then also back to the first secret society known as the Brotherhood of the Snake or the Brotherhood of the Serpent, which I discuss in uh, The Lost Secrets of Ancient America, you see that these groups originally were intended to take knowledge that was imparted to humans from whatever these gods are, whether these gods are aliens or whatever whatever they are, whatever information was imparted to humans from these quote-unquote gods was then um, supposed to be only given to certain people because they didn't want the masses to have all of this knowledge and we just have total chaos. So originally, the first secret society was set up with secrecy in order to keep the stuff from falling into the wrong hands. And that ideology of secrecy stayed in place throughout the years, whether it went on to be uh, the Pythagorean groups and or later the Freemasons and then uh, the Knights Templar, whatever it may be. All of these groups, the original secrecy and the reason for the secrecy morphed from it being strictly about protecting the information to then becoming secrecy that would become a form of control. And this has existed from the very beginning into the modern day. And those things, when you think about those things I just talked about, Jimmy, and you go down those routes and you look at it, you can then come to a very strong conclusion about 
who really runs the world? The Vatican. No, I'm not, again, I, again, not. I, you, I don't think you can you can boil it down to one group, one name, or another. Okay. I think you can only boil it down to a groups worldwide that have all been working together that go back to the very beginning foundations of civilizations on the planet. Okay. Okay. And when when I look at uh, let's uh, just for general purposes here. Uh, we have Putin and we have Obama, you know, it, uh, as an example. There is somebody that they answer to. And and it has been whoever they're answering to was there before they came into power. Right. Yes. And that that same group person or persons is going to be there after they leave. And what is it? There is something there that they know that uh, these two heads of state don't. And so what is the agenda and what is it that they know? What, what is it? Just like you just said, the, the, uh, the information came from the heavens, came from somewhere, whether it was E.T. or a god. But this information has always been kept private. And and that has been the struggle. So what is it that that puppet string uh, manipulator? What is it that they know, and 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 why why is it so important that we don't know? That's a, again, it's another good question, and it's again one that I don't pretend to have all the answers for, Jimmy. I'm just going to uh, you know give you my best speculation from the research I've done, and it does indicate to me that whatever this whatever it may be. The importance, and this, it doesn't matter what leader and what country, what time period that you're talking about, right. look at all world events. It does seem that no matter what happens, there seems to be a large importance on keeping the status quo, keeping their formation or the way that they envision society to be perpetuating it itself into the future indefinitely. Now, for whatever reason, I can't really tell you. We could speculate on it all day. But it seems that if you really wanted to boil it down to a base idea, the base idea is to keep their system in place and going uninterrupted uh, indefinitely. And I think that um, whether that has to do with some uh, future revelation or future event, whether that has to do with um, that being what some, you know, <sighs> controlling group or being from somewhere uh, wants as their will for us. Again, all these things are speculation. But the fact of the matter is, as you mentioned, it doesn't matter what leader it is or what time period it is. It's very clear when you do the research that these guys are taking orders from a higher level. And at some point you hit a brick wall. You know, you go up and up and up and you get to names and you get to the point where you start to understand that the people that really run the planet, their names are not on the Internet. Their, their names are not there. I have encountered things like this. I've had people tell me stories of, oh, my dad, you know, worked with this guy and he was, you know, involved in, uh, you know, some high level stuff. And then you go look up this guy's name and you can't find Heidner or Harrop on, on the name, but you can find David Rockefeller and, uh, you know, Lord Rothschild all day. I think that's one thing people need to consider is that um, I don't think the people who really run this planet are going to be uh, hot late. Let's just put it like that. Hi, Dino. Say hi to Josh. Hi, Josh. Hello. Good evening, D- um, Jimmy. Uh, you're in an area in the latter part of this discussion, which I have a little bit of knowledge of. I was trained in the latter part of my life by the Jesuits. And yes. while they are very academic, and while they are, and we're just speculating here because I don't know, but they're very academic, but they've also been kind of like uh, the the... Uh, there's many adjectives you could use, but they're part of the Catholic Church that kind of got things done, dealt with finances. Um, and the whole thought, I know, when I was, as I was growing up, and I think after World War II, at least in the Western world, was if you give everybody a liberal arts education, then, oh, they're all going to think the same, see, because the liberal arts education, oh, well, this is how we deal with things. Right. But as I get older and I learn things, uh, you know, if there is, which I believe, an extraterrestrial presence, there are many different races and factions of extraterrestrials. It's not just gray guys. And they have different agendas. But being from the outside of our society, 
you know how you can always tell when someone is screwing up because you're watching them from the outside, but they are sometimes themselves not as aware of it because we're all kind of self-centered and worrying about our own fears, wants, and needs. So if what you're saying is, you know, this speculation, this would be a perfect way for an extraterrestrial civilization or the others who might have been here since ancient times to take over because they'd say, hey, we'll play these guys and we'll use the guys that are undercover to do our dirty work for us. What do you well, say? I couldn't, you know, I couldn't agree with you more. In fact, my uh, my film series that I mentioned earlier, the loss, uh, the not the Lost Secrets, but the uh, the Secret Right, Volume One and Volume Two, both of those, we talk about the Jesuits uh, extensively in both of those. As you mentioned, they're they're the intellectual and planning end of world events. We have a one of the films we have a, an actual ex Jesuit whistleblower uh, who talks about how the Jesuits planned, but they didn't carry out the military branch, which would be. Uh, the Knights of Malta, the Sovereign Military Order of Malta, who uh, have members in all branches of government worldwide, they're the, the, the acting end of it. They take the orders from the Jesuits, which is the intellectual end of it, and this whistleblower talks about how the Jesuits came up with the plan to assassinate JFK and, uh, and carry that out. And they do seem to be um, one of the highest levels of power and one of the ones that people know the least about. Um, so the connection between them, the religious element, and uh, possibly, you know, these extraterrestrials and whatnot in this sort of being the stopgap between those two. Uh, you're, you're right. I mean, it's very, very, we don't know that for a fact, but you're right on the right path, I believe, in, in making that connection between these long-established religious con, uh, uh, organizations and these uh, visitors that are make up, you know, as you mentioned, different races, different types and all that. I think you're on the right track. What about David Icke? Is he uh, uh, actually, actually, hold on. I said that the wrong way. I asked it the wrong way. There are a lot of, uh, we were talking about Bill Cooper earlier. Um, well, not on the show, but <laughs> earlier. Um, uh, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of radical ideas out there. David Icke is one. David Wilcock is another um, that have this multiple race reptilian uh, frame of are are they going to turn out to be correct? You know, do you do you, do you feel do you, in in your research? Do you feel like they're on to something? Uh, well, personally, no. Um, I, I <laughs> uh, gosh, you know, you want me to just be brutally honest here? Uh, well, I, I, well, of course, I do, <laughs> but but and I only say that you know, Bill Cooper is not David Ike, but what I'm trying to say is. Um, sometimes these, these thoughts, you know, that are coming from way outside of the box have a way of coming true and as radical as Ike may be or, or Wilcock and, and reptilians and, and running monarchs and, and hybrids, it, you know, sometimes these things tend to come true. And I, I agree, but I think sometimes Jimmy, that it's more of the, of the fact that again, the same thing, they're putting out some things that are true. And, of course, some of that is going to appear to be, oh, okay, maybe they were right. But it's, in, it's those other things. Like Wilcock was, you know, he was number one in telling everybody that the world was going to end in 2012. I mean, that guy was a numero uno number one. How he still has a career, I'll never know. He was the guy. I haven't forgot this. I remember stuff. And he was on every show fear-mongering the world was going to end. And nobody calls him on it or holds him to it. Right. I, you know, I, I've had my own experiences with. Um, I interviewed him probably after I'd been on air only three or four months at that point. I interviewed David Icke very early on. That video, that uh, audio is still out there on YouTube. And one of the things that happened to me while I was during, while I was conducting this interview with him is I felt this, and I've never experienced this um, with anybody else I've ever interviewed. I felt like I was having my, what's the way I can put this? Um, I just felt like my, my etherical energy, my, my energy, my soul energy, my body was being artificially drained by some external source the entire time I was doing this interview with him. When I was done, I'm somebody who's very, very um, sensitive to, to those to, to energies and vibes and that kind of thing. And if I walk into a room and you know, I don't like the vibe of it, I'll, I'll leave. I'm just, just how I am. I'm really sensitive to it. But when I interviewed David Icke, I was uh, flat on my butt after I got done interviewing. I felt like I had I had ran a marathon. I could. I mean, I was completely tired, and uh, this was in early 2008. About a year later, I drove from Texas to New Mexico with some friends 
to go see David Icke uh, perform with his, you know, 13 hour right. extravaganza. And it was literally 13 hours. It was all day thing. And um, so we went and we, and we went to the, the talk and um, within the first 10 minutes of this talk, that feeling that I had when I did the interview started coming back to me. Wow. I started feeling like am I, I was being drained. I couldn't, I couldn't explain it. And they had these barricades up uh, along the stage where he was talking that where you couldn't see what was behind them. And I was just like, why do they need that? It's a big empty room. Why not just have that be open space? Why have that all cordoned off with these tall high rise rafters where, you, I mean, there could be anything behind there. And I had to go out with a friend and get some air. And we both just felt the same thing yet again. And, uh, you know, I don't know, Jimmy, this stuff is stranger than fiction. I mean, you know, there's been people that have put out there, well, hey, you know, what if uh, what if some of these guys like Ike and others talk about reptiles? What if they are the reptiles? You know, I, I don't know if that's necessarily true, but I can only go by what I've experienced. And those two things I experienced with him were very strange. I've never experienced that with anybody else in my life. And um, But at the same time, the stuff that he talks about, like, you know, the reptilians, he tells this story about seeing – um, some, I think it was the former prime minister of Britain, the guy who was the prime minister of Britain in the seventies. Um, David Icke relates this story about being backstage at a TV show at the same time he was, and this guy running into him and him scanning David Icke, looking at him and his eyes rolling over black and scanning him up and down that exact scenario before I even ever heard that story from David Icke happened to me, uh, back in 2006 when I had confronted, uh, uh, former, uh, 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 well, what a speaker of the house, Tom delay. Shut up. A, whoa, 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 yeah, whoa. Let, this pump, is unbelievable. Pump let the brakes, pump the brakes there, Josh. <laughs> you got to stop and, and, and explain this. This was, this was insane. I mean, th this was one of those, again, I can only tell you and base what I believe on this on what has happened to me and what I've experienced. Well, he and is a rep. You can them. look at him and see reptilian anyway. So and, there well, you go. <laughs> I'll get to that. I'll get to that. At that point, I didn't know anything about it. I was, uh, you know, back then, this was back in the 9-11 truth days, the heyday of that 2005, 2006. Right. Somewhere in there was the heyday of that. He was doing a book signing here in Dallas. And so um, uh, some of us in our 9-11 group were like, hey, you know, let's go down and ask him about 9-11. And nobody else ended up showing up but me and my sister. And we had... Uh, we had on these we had on these nine eleven shirts. Uh, her, uh, my shirt said, uh, "What happened to World Trade Center Building Number Seven? Mine had the question. Her shirt had the answer. It said, "Controlled demolition." So we're the only two. We're waiting on uh, Tom Delay to get there. We're in the parking lot, I'm kind of standing out by the car, and I see this car pull up, and I kind of see him walking out. And he's he's walking over, and uh, he walks up and sees us, sees us immediately standing there, and says, "You know, hey, how y'all doing?" And we said, "Oh, hey, how's it going?" And right at that moment, he looks at my shirt, looks at her shirt, face turns blood red. <laughs> then he looks at me. I see his eyes turn black. He looks me up and down, looks at her up and down, looks back at me and says, y'all have a good day, and walks right into the Barnes & Noble, and I was mortified. We left. We didn't even go in and try to confront him or do anything after that. And I, at the time, I just thought, whoa, that's just weird. You know, that's just some weird thing. I didn't know anything about it. And then I heard that. Ike story of him describing that same thing happened. And at, even at that time, I was kind of wish washy on Ike. But when I heard that story, well, wait a minute here, you know, I had almost that exact same thing happen to me. And then, and then on top of that, I later on, you know, was just looking, I was like, well, let me see, you know, uh, if there's ever anybody who's ever said anything about Tom DeLay being a reptile or something. <laughs> so I went and looked it up and did a search on it. And I'll be damned. The first thing I saw was, uh, <laughs> was a page that said high reptilian overlord commander, Tom Delay yeah. and I just went. There just there. There's got to be something to this. Wow, that is so, crazy. I, you know, again, I'm not trying to tell that story to get or to tell people I believe in reptilians and I believe they're real and they're a threat. I'm not telling you that story for, for to have that effect on you. I'm just again trying to tell you things that I've experienced um, that coincide with things researchers have said. That again, I don't even really like David. Like I don't even agree with him. But I cannot ignore or deny the fact that I had an experience exactly as he described it. I'm looking uh, at the pictures that are being tweeted right now of Tom DeLay. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, I'm, I'm really reptilian for sure. You know, and I'm looking at this picture. Yeah, he's always kind of freaked me out. This, yeah, is, a, th this is the thing about uh, David Icke. First off, I genuinely like the guy. 
I really, really do. I think he's compassionate. I think he's very, very smart. He's got a degree in crowd control that we know nothing about. He's gone to some special school and his ability to do, like you just said, you know, his 13 hours, eight hour uh, marathon seminars that he does. Um, and and I, 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 I really enjoy listening to him. Uh, it, it, the, when you hear him uh, speak with such conviction, uh, now I, I didn't experience what you're talking about when he was on uh, the show with us, but I found him to be the exact opposite of what his reputation is. You know, he's a hard nose, loud mouth, you know, in your face. And I, I don't think he's any of that. I think he no, does. He's a, very soft spoken. Yeah. And I think he does. He, he's, he, you know, he, he goes into that zone to get his message across at times. I think he comes across a little brash, but I really, I think the guy is cool. I really do. And, and, the, and, and same thing for Wilcock, David Wilcock. I think I, I find him to be very warm. Very cool. Um, uh, Rita will tell you when we saw him out of contact in the desert, he's got his security team around him and armed. I mean, real deal dudes. Right. And so he speak. he was just on the show and he speaks and we dash outside of the hall and he jumps into a golf cart and, and, and I walk up, I'm the only person outside. And, uh, and I said, David, Jimmy church. And he's, and he's told his security guys to stop the cart jumps off the cart and comes up and, and, you know, how you doing? You know, I really believe these are warm, compassionate guys that really believe what they're saying. And, and, and I listen, I really do. Um, I, I think they have a closed mind when it comes to guys that think, uh, they know what they're saying. You know, they know what they're saying in public to people, you know, and, uh, I I listen. I I I, I do not want to have a closed mind. I I don't. Just like uh, like I said with Bill Cooper, you know, if you go and you close your mind off and you're not listening, and then the next thing you know, you're wrong. Well, you know what? It's okay to be right, but what if you're wrong? And that's my point. I I have open ears with all of that. And look at you and delay. That's a really really good point. You hear that. You hear that from Mike, and then you have your own experience yourself, and it makes you just want to stop and scratch your head and go, hmm, maybe there is something to this. Yeah, and that's and that's something I always want to make sure I get across to people, too, is that you know I don't have to um, like someone or be you know into the work. Same thing with me, to give them credit for what they're right about or, or you know, as much as I would give them blame for something they'd be wrong about. And, and with, with that instance, you know, for me um, – it, to have an experience like that, that mirrored that Ike story identically was just something I, I was, I was nice thing to have. And it, it, it is something that goes a long way to convince you. But I think the most important thing, Jimmy, for people to understand out there is whether it be Josh Reeves or David Ike or Jimmy church or whoever it may be, no one single person is ever going to have all the answers and all the right answers. Take the best stuff from everybody that you can and form your own conclusion. That's the most important thing. And that's exactly what I'm trying to say. Hi, you're live on Fade to Black. Say hi to Josh Reeves. Who's calling? Where are you calling from? Hey, this is Steve from Bluefield. Steve, how are you tonight, sir? Doing all right, Jimmy. How are you? It's how are a- you, Josh? Hey, doing all right. Thanks for being on, man. <clears throat> okay, here we go, fellas. Okay, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, well, I was talking about who's right and who's wrong. You know, which researcher knows this, you know, knows that. At the end of the day, Jimmy, we we have to come together. We can argue the fact whether someone's right or wrong when it's all said and done, when it's all over. We have to get everyone's mind open to the fact that we are live that we've been lied to from the giddy up, flat out. We've been yep. lied from the giddy up, and we've got to open everyone's mind and come together. All the researchers need to come together. Who cares whether you're right or you're wrong? Who cares? That's exactly, I think, it, well, isn't that what we're saying here tonight? Well, I, I, I think so. <laughs> you know, but <laughs> uh, I but think, we got to, you know, we got to, you know, I hope that everyone understands that, that that's, yeah. what, ha- that's what has to happen. Yeah, yeah you're I absolutely, definitely agree. You know, it's not, it's not about, you know who who's right or wrong here? No, 
No, and and uh, and I, this Josh is the guest, and I'm speaking, and that's rude. But but I'll say this, Steve, and and you and I know each other well enough now. You know where I'm coming from. Um, right. all, all of us are are. I'll say it. It's the mantra of this show. We're rolling this rock uphill. What we do know uh, as a collective, whether it's about ufology, whether it's about 9-11, whether it's about gas prices, and whether it's about defective cars or underwear or Ebola, it doesn't matter. You're, you need to figure out what the real truth is. You've got to constantly, constantly be aware. <coughs> and, and I think as a collective, as a society today, we're doing just that. And that's your concern. That's Josh's concern. That is this audience's concern. We're not stupid anymore. We're not. And and you're absolutely right. Well, who's right and wrong doesn't matter. It's the truth and us sticking together today, arm in arm. Right. I, I mean, I agree because it's you know it doesn't matter whether Kitchen is right, you know whether Josh is right, whether Von Daniken is right, you know it, it don't matter. But with we that have said, to pull everybody together. But with that, everybody has to come together. See, I agree with that one hundred percent. But with that said, I think it's also important. I want to make sure this is crystal clear. I also think it's also important to make sure that we aren't ju- in in the spirit of you know what's all coming together. I also think it's also our responsibility to make sure that we're not just taking what somebody says because we like that person. You know, and we, we we have a moniker of trust that we built up in our head about them. I think it's important that, you know, we take these things and make sure it's again, it's not about who's right and who's wrong. But we need to make sure that we don't have people who are putting out wrong things intentionally to, um, you know, sort of uh, uh, spoil it for everybody else and to uh, mess up the, you know, just foul the pot and everything. And I think we do see a lot of that. I think there is a lot of people out there who intentionally put out misinformation and wrong information and do serve the powers that be. And I think it's important that those be um, singled out when we can. And that's, that's one thing I've done in a lot of my work and a lot of my films. But um, I also, at the same time, have been someone who has said for the longest time that um, this division and division between us on any of this stuff just is exactly what they want anyway. That's exactly right. Does no, a, nobody in you You hit the nail square on the head, Josh. Absolutely. You know, we you know, talk about the powers to be. It's hard for me to explain to everybody that's listening kind of where I come from. I, I own two businesses. I have a very large cattle farm. So I understand the economics that goes on in this country. For us to, to believe that we even know who those people are, we've got... You've got to be out of your mind. You know, people want to look at Forbes and you see Bill Gates or, you know, Warren Buffett. These people have no idea the, what you're dealing with with the powers to be. These people have vast, vast resources, resources that surpass the, all the richest people in the world combined. And, and, right. and, and, <laughs> and, and they, and they just take control, you know, well, yeah, yeah, I, I, they, I, they can, they also control those people. You know, the, I think those people are basically a front to disguise the fact that they are there. That's what I was saying earlier. You know, the people who really run the world, their names are not on the internet. They're not in Forbes. That's right. They're not in Forbes. You don't, you know, the, it, it's uncomprehendable to, First of all, for people to understand, it, what fifth set for Bill Gates? Uh, he's worth, uh, I don't know, $54 billion or something like that. It is so hard to comprehend that kind of money. It, it's it, it's overwhelming. And then to realize that there are people out there that control and have so much more than that. It's very, it's really hard to wrap your head around and understand what we're what we're dealing with globally, and what the global impact that these people have, and the power that they have. You're exactly right, Steve. I mean, to think about it, if you if you if you just stop and think about 
the richest person that you know, the richest person that you know is absolute. The richest person that you know is less than pocket change to these people. The, the, I just think about whoever it is that you're thinking about. (laughs) I don't care who it is, is absolute pocket change or below, you know, a piece of a penny. And uh, we're up against it, Steve. You have a good night, man. Tomorrow night's fader hey, night, brother. Hey, thanks for the time, Jimmy. Always, always. Thank you. Um, yeah, isn't that, uh, no matter what you think about the power of, you know, like I said, Putin or, or, or you know, whoever's the current president of the United States or whoever's running China, wh- whoever, you know, whoever you're thinking about, there is somebody with much more power. And that can that's, actually di- dictate. That's just one of the constants, Jimmy, in all my years of research. It, the constant thing that I find, no matter how deep I dig and how far I go and looking at this, is that there is always some level of control beyond what you can see on the surface. And it's hard to, you know, it's hard to quantize that. It's hard to put that in a way where people can see it and understand it. And it's one of the reasons why. People like myself and, you know, people in the past, Bill Cooper, whoever it may be. It's one of the reasons why we are always is really the single handed reason why we always tell people to do their own research, because there are certain things that you intuit from this stuff when you research it. That is hard for anyone to put in language to describe. It's something you can only experience and know for yourself by looking into it. So when you start to look into um, the really the history of control, the history of there being any other human, uh, you know, over the top of and ruling over another human for any reason. When you go as far back as you can with that, you start to see these correlations and you see these things in the modern day where there is this importance. You know, uh, the the good example is like uh, you know, like the bloodline thing or the 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 royals and how that traces back to these ancient clans and whatnot that go back to certain lands. It's all of it has to do with keeping these certain elements in power. And as I mentioned earlier, keeping everything perpetuating itself into the future indefinitely. And anything that gets in the way that may stop this system from perpetuating itself indefinitely gets squashed, whether it be a movement or a Kennedy or whatever it may be, anything that gets in their way gets squashed. And it's got to go beyond just, you know, regular human people. Think about it. These guys bleed. As far as you and I know, Jimmy, the people that run the world, they bleed the same way we do. But here we are thousands of years later, and we're still being ruled over by these same people. Why? It can't just be because we're all too weak to ever do anything about it. There is something that is, goes well beyond what the material world will show you as far as who is really in control. I got to thank you for coming on the show. Well, thank you, Jimmy. I had a blast. No, I'm I'm serious. I thank you, thank you. I can't wait to get you back on. And you've got to come out uh, to California. We got to knock back a couple of beers and uh, you know, throw some ribs, uh, you know, on the grill and kick you back. I can only imagine what that conversation would be like. Josh Reeves, everybody. The Global Reality is his website, as everybody knows. You can get to it through jimmychurchradio.com. Just click on Josh Reeves. Hey, Jimmy, do I have time to throw out a special deal for your listeners? You can do it right now. You've got. 30 seconds. Here, here it is. Uh, people can go get all my films. You can get downloads and DVDs and Blu-rays and all that. But I'm going to do a special deal just because I like Jimmy so much. The first 50 people that go buy one of my DVDs, Lost Secrets Volume 1 or 2, will get a free download instantaneous. So you'll be able to watch it while you're waiting for your movie to get there. First 50 people, Jimmy's audience only. I'm only doing this for you. And, uh, again, I just really appreciate the opportunity to come on, Jimmy. And uh, I definitely want to do it again. Uh, all the best. You know, we should do this like once a week. <laughs> Absolutely, it's great, man. We can just talk about whatever. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. We I, have a round table, you yeah. know. <laughs> we need to do it, man. Thank you, Josh. Thank you. Absolutely amazing, Josh Reeves. Everybody, have a good night, Josh. Wow. Whoa, whoa, whoa! I'm gonna roll straight from that to credits. Thank you, Josh Reeves. Do go to the Global Reality. Uh, dot com. Go check out Josh's website. There's a really cool special offer for you right there. So go and uh, check out volume one and volume two. Josh is the man. And I, I'll say it right now. He is the man. Thank you, Josh Reeves. 
theglobalreality.com. Got to get him back soon. Stay tuned. Coming up next is After Hours AM. Special thanks to Keith Rowland and our Bell Fade Blacks executive producers, Rita Kamarian. Show is produced by Hilton J. Palm, Mark D. Kovar, and, uh, you know, got to give credit to Leslie S. Johnson the third. Fady by Dale Romero. Graphics by Method of Signaling. Check out faders.org. Go hang out. Announcers are Steve Harder, Gene Vito, Mark D. Kovar. Music is by Doug Aldridge. Intro by Space Boy. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Dark Matter Radio Network. I'm your humble host, Jimmy Church. Tomorrow night, Fader Night. Be safe. See ya. Yeah.